radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. I need your help to get to the year 1985. You're listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Good evening, Fade to Black. Bespoke Radio for the Masses. Uh, yeah, man, how you doing? How you doing? Today's Tuesday, Tuesday, July 26th, 2022. Tonight, Nick Redfern. That's right. Let's do this, man. <laughs> I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States. Hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black for KJCR, the Game Changer, and UnX Networks. I'm yours, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? How you doing? How you doing? You know, I'm in a great mood because tonight we have very special guest. Nick Redfern is joining us. He is back. We're going to have a full night of Our Strange World. That's right. Nick has written over 30 books and all on high strangeness. And and tonight we're going to take a walk through. All of it. That's what we are going to do tonight. I always love it when Nick is on the show. He's one of my favorite guests. And uh, all of my guests are my favorite guests. All right. Kind of talked about that last night in the AMA. Jimmy, what's your favorite interview of all time? All of them. Even the bad ones. <laughs> uh, very rarely do we have a uh, uh, a show that's a, a clunker and they just don't happen anymore. Kind of you know, had one or two in the past so far gone. And I have uh, defragged my hard drive and, and those shows don't even exist. They, they don't, they don't, they do. They're gone. They're gone. And they, they won't be found in some kind of metadata in my brain. They're just gone. Well, that's tonight. Nick Redfern is here. Tomorrow night, Nick Pope is here. And yeah, I guess it's the week of the two Nicks. So tomorrow night, Nick Pope is here. We're going to be talking about government UFO programs. And Thursday night is another fader night with open lines all night long. I want to thank everybody uh, last night that uh, sent in your questions for the AMA. It was uh, all the AMAs are, are are pretty fun to do. But last night was that was a notch above. That was a whole lot of fun. And then uh, today, I'm poking around, goofing around, and uh, on Twitter. Then I saw a whole list of questions in in Twitter that I didn't see last night, and uh, and I was like, oh man! I told everybody hashtag F two B hashtag F two B Q so I can see them, and then they, you know posted all those questions in 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 the original post and i i did not check i wasn't ignoring you i was just following my own instructions so there you go but that was a great show last night thank you to everybody uh, that hung out with us amas are the best those are uh, the, the absolute best now uh let's see Coming up uh, next month, Tuesday night, August 16th, I will be at UPARS, 
right here in Los Angeles, California, in Studio City. Not tech, it's Los Angeles County. It's like five miles from LA. Uh, I guess if you go over uh, Coldwater Canyon, right there. Uh, if you go over Coldwater Canyon, well, you're in, technically you're in Beverly Hills. You're not in L.A. yet, but it is L.A. It's Studio City in between Sherman Oaks and Burbank. Studio City right there. They call it Studio City because that's where the studios are at. Pretty, pretty, pretty creative, I would think. Studio City, California, uparsla.org. Go and get your tickets and information. If you're going to be in Los Angeles, if you live in Los Angeles, if you're a fate or not visiting Los Angeles, you're going to want to be there August 16th. And uh, I keep saying this, but it's very important. We only have seating for 200. It's going to sell out. It's going to be packed. So if you want to go, you need to go to UPARS LA right now. Get your RSVP in. I don't know how uh, Steve Marillo handles things over there. So just visit UPARS LA. You will figure out what to do. All right. And then coming up. I am busy uh, for the rest of the year. Just going to let everybody know that, uh, well, coming up the weekend of September 16th, I'm in Joshua Tree, California for a private sky watch. I told everybody how you can get in on that. All you got to do is mint some NFTs, uh, 10 of them. You go to forbiddenclub.com, that's with a four, and get yourself your black card, and and then you will get your invitation to come out uh, to that very limited uh with uh but it's going to be a really cool event we're also going to go to giant rock so we're going to have two nights of sky watching and that is the weekend of september 16th then of course in october i will be in egypt with 80 friends and billy carson um in between all of this uh, i've got some other events too uh that uh, are booked up i'm filming uh next week uh, for a new film. I will make the announcement on that uh, here very soon. It's not my film. I'm just appearing in the film, but it's a great film. And uh, my scenes are being shot next week. So I've got that going on. And then uh, from uh, this uh, August, I should say, August forward, um, I am filming uh, my new TV show. And uh, the schedule for that came in this morning. It's uh, it's absolute craziness from here on out. I was I today after a flurry of phone calls and uh, paperwork and stuff. Uh, I said out loud to myself, "The madness begins," and it does. Oh, um, I talked to you guys about uh, the cruise uh, going to Mexico. That is in April. I said it was in March. It is April. And uh, I got uh, some of the stuff today. I will post it tomorrow. I'm waiting for a couple of more graphics uh, to come in. But I got some stuff today. It's in April. Um, and if you would like uh, to do that, just kind of block out. Uh, I think it's April 7th through the 14th. Um, I'll have that up tomorrow. And then, of course, I can't believe it. Uh, you know, we're in August. We're going into September, then October, and then the new Conference season starts, and we've got Conscious Life Expo coming up. Got a huge announcement uh, for uh, this big event that is going down in 2023. And uh, I'll be making that announcement uh, about this time next week. But uh, very busy. I'm just glad, very, very happy that life is is getting back on track. After nearly a two-year vacation, I, everybody went through big changes. I went through big changes myself, personally, and uh, it, it's time to get focused now. I had said a couple of years ago um, that this pandemic is going to get over. Uh, it, it's going to end. It's it 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 is going to end one day. It may not seem like that right now, but I told everybody get ready because you want to get on the freeway. And go straight over to the fast lane. And, and you want to be ready uh, to go when things start again. And they are. And it's it's crazy. Like I said today to myself out loud, the madness begins. So here we go. All right. Get your free membership to the Unex Network right now. I want you to go to the unexnetwork.com 
And while you are over there, you'll get the monthly newsletter, you get blog access, you're going to get uh, event notices, a free digital copy of the quarterly magazine, uh, discounts to their events. And right now they have a contest going. So I want you to go over to the unxnetwork.com. Uh, first, the grand prize is hotel and tickets to their event in Cape Girardeau. And they have a bunch of other uh, giveaways that they're going to be doing, ticket packages and stuff like that. And go and get signed up and get everything going over at the unxnetwork.com. And uh, maybe you'll win. They're going to do a, a drawing live. I think it's going to be on YouTube, live on YouTube. And maybe they'll pull your name out of the hat. So head over to the unxnetwork.com right now. Okay, and I mentioned this last night on the show before we get started tonight. Eden Pure, who absolutely loves the fader knots and loves fade to black. Um, their thunderstorm is now the three-pack special. Three-pack, you save $200, and you get free shipping. So get three. You need three of these. See, mine's running right now. See, it's lit up. Ah, it's running in the bunker. You can't hear it. And kills viruses, purifies the air, gets the stink out of your room, all of that. Maybe you got a cat box, right? You, you need... <laughs> What do you do when you have company come over to the house and you've got a litter box, right? Well, you don't have to worry about it if you get the thunderstorm, all right? I don't have to worry about the sweat in my home gym. That's all I'm concerned about right now, and it's gone. Plug it in your car. It's USB. You can plug it in the wall. It's small, and it works great. Ask any of the fader knots that have got, hey, is, is the thunderstorm all that? Is Jimmy just being a hype man? I can't hype this product enough. So click on the link below. The promo code is FADER3, Thunderstorm 3-Pack Special. The links for everything, all of our sponsors are in the description box below. They're over at jimmychurchradio.com. You can follow me on Twitter at jchurchradio. Follow me on Instagram. I posted on Inst Instagram today. At Jimmy Church Radio on Instagram. Hashtag F2B on Twitter is the sandbox. We don't bite. Come and hang out with us over on Twitter. Look, Twitter is live in front of me right now. Let's see. Lord Nelson just posted 59 seconds ago. Philip Daniels just posted, right? Olivia is here tonight. King is here tonight. Cassandra's here tonight. Janine and uh, Stephen, UFO tweets. Uh, UFO tweet says, Hey, Jimmy, is there such a thing as, as a budget night vision? I haven't messed around with budget night vision. I have one color. It's called the, the scion, the Orion. I have that and it records, um, and it's color. I have it. It's like a backup. Uh, but I use the gen three. And, uh, so the gen threes, you can poke around online and you can get a decent pair of gen threes for, uh, $1,500. Now, if that's a lot of money, Gen 3s used to be three grand, just to give you an idea. But uh, uh, if that's a lot of money, you can, I have, I haven't done this yet. All right. I got to get to the news and other stuff, but let me just say this. I go to Amazon, search night vision goggles. I've done this a few times and I did it a couple of weeks ago and I was going to buy a couple of pair. There, there's some inexpensive stuff there, inexpensive enough to where you're not going to freak out if if they're not what you expect. And I was going to do that just to test them out and and see uh, what is going on. Um, so plug in night vision goggles. Go to Amazon and, and see what you can find. I, I can't recommend anything because I haven't checked it out. All right. But that's from UFO Tweets. That's what's happening over in the sandbox right now. Hashtag F2B on Twitter. Let's get to the breaking news. Crazy news day today. And if you follow my social media, you saw some of the announcements. Uh, that was it's just, just a crazy news day. And China, the remnants of that massive Chinese rocket that delivered a new module to China's space station on Monday, are expected to fall to Earth early next week, according to the U.S. Space Command, which is tracking the rocket's trajectory. 
the 23-ton Long March 5B rocket, which carried the Wenchian Laboratory module, took off from Hainan Island at 2.22 p.m. local time Sunday, July 24th. And the module successfully docked with China's orbital outpost. Its job completed, the rock has gone into an uncontrolled descent towards Earth's atmosphere, and it's not clear where it will land. The uncontrolled descent marks the third time that the country has been accused of not properly handling space debris from its rocket stage. I remember last year I was tracking that with everybody else. I was watching the descent to see where it was coming down. I had all of the satellite tracking software, and I was watching it by the second. It was crazy, and I guess I'm about to do it again on Monday. All right, here we go. New footage. Now, I posted this today. You can go over to my Facebook, and I think I did it on Twitter, too, as well. New footage showing a giant strange looking seven foot long tentacled sea creature floating in the depths of the Pacific ocean has left researchers questioning if they have discovered a new species. A team of scientists spotted the strange animal while on board the EV Nautilus, a research vessel used by the ocean exploration trust, a nonprofit organization conducting deep sea research In a recently released video, the expedition researchers watched the bizarre creature come into focus. Moments later, the scientists spied another of the oddball creatures nearby, though they were unable to record video of the second individual. Crazy. (laughs) E.T. I'm telling you right now, that is straight out of the movie Alien. All right, scientists. Also, uh, I did a lot of water stuff today, and uh, I'm sure you guys saw it. Scientists exploring a submerged mountain range in the mid-Atlantic stumbled onto something that they can't explain, an organized series of holes punched in the floor of the Atlantic Ocean at a depth of 1.7 miles. That's 8,976 feet below the surface. In a perfectly straight line. They're rectangles. It's crazy. I posted the images on Facebook and Twitter for you to check out. They are amazing. And I want your comments. What do you think that is? A mile and a half down. Crazy. Well, it happened today. A jacket worn to the moon by Buzz Aldrin set a new record for the most ever paid at auction for a flown-in-space artifact. The bidding for Aldrin's in-flight coverall jacket opened at $500,000 at Sotheby's in New York earlier today, and it didn't last long because a few minutes later, the hammer dropped at $2.25 million with Sotheby's premiums included The jacket was sold to an unnamed buyer bidding by phone for $2.772.5 million. Now, no word, and I tried to find out, did Buzz own this? Did Buzz put this up for auction? Is Buzz getting the $2.2 million? Or did somebody else have the jacket and put it up for auction? And did did Buzz get a cut? (laughs) says E. Aldrin right there on the jacket. It's just a jacket. It's like a jacket that you wear. Well, it went to the moon. You know, I I guess you, you know, you want to, you want a windbreaker when you're on the lunar module. It, It makes sense. Right. Right. It's nice too. Nice looking jacket. Let's get this show cracking on this day in history. 1984, Ed Gain. The serial killer infamous for skinning human corpses dies of complications from cancer in a Wisconsin prison at the age of 77. Psycho, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and Silence of the Lambs were based on Gaines' crimes. That dude was hyenas. Sick. Fader fact. All right, here you go. Here you go. This is trippy. So just think about this. 
if you started a pyramid scheme with five people and each of those five brought in and recruited five more people by the 15th tier, you would have exceeded the entire population of the earth. And that is your fader fact. Yeah. I saw this documentary. Uh, I can't remember specifically what it was on, uh, but the, it, it involved a, uh, a pyramid scheme with some ladies in a, in, in this town in the Midwest and inside of like a month, right? It's a crazy series too. Inside of a month, the entire town, <laughs> it was like everybody was in on it. Judges, cops, school teachers, the clergy, <laughs> Everybody was in on it. I was like, oh, man, we're going to have to arrest the entire town. It was nuts, man. It was nuts. And that's that's what's crazy about a pyramid scheme. If, uh, if they take off, they take off. Everybody, right? Think about it. You and five friends take over the world <laughs> in 15 days. Buy my video and I can show you how. Yeah. All right. Tonight, very special guest Nick Redfern is joining us. We're going to be talking about our strange world. And it is stranger than you think. Tomorrow night, Nick Pope is here. We're going to be talking about government UFO programs. And then Thursday is another fader night with open lines all night long. All right. Ah, River Moon Coffee, rivermoonwellness.com. Click on the link below. Fade to Black Blend. Mm. French press. You've got to have a French press. You need um. You need a a, a pour over. Pour over. You get you know the chrome cone. You don't some pour over. You can get it and you put the cone paper cone thing in it. Don't do that. Just get a metal one. And then one day you do the pour over, the next day you do the French press. And then if you're just in a crazy, whacked out mood, you fire up your Mr. Coffee machine. But do whole bean, get a grinder. Get a grinder. I've done everything that I can to help you guys out. I posted pictures of my grinder. I posted pictures of uh, my coffee setup. You guys can see everything. I've got three different types of coffee in front of me. I rotate through. Right? I don't do the same coffee every single day. Sometimes I do, but I mix it up. I mix it up, except for showtime. When it's showtime, it's fade to black blend. River Moon Coffee. Oh, man. Our strange world. Our strange world. Check this out. Have you thought much about CERN or the Large Hadron Collider? I have. Dark matter, black holes, and antimatter. The three scariest things in the universe. The three scariest things in the universe that we know absolutely nothing about are being created or trying to be created right now as I speak to you. Right now, in real time. Now, it's not, it's not just about three specific things, right? It's, 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 it's not about those. For me, it's the other stuff that happens when you just go slamming stuff together at the speed of light just to see it light up and go boom. Because that's what they're doing at the LHC. It started up in September 2008, right? And we've had nothing but high strangeness ever since. 
They did it in collaboration with over 10,000 scientists and hundreds of universities and laboratories, as well as more than 100 countries. It lies in a tunnel 17 miles in circumference and 574 feet beneath the France-Switzerland border near Geneva. And nobody knows what's going on. They are literally saying out loud, you know what, let's, let's try to create a black hole. We don't know anything about black holes. Well, let's, let's see if we can create one. Don't they suck in everything forever around it and spit it out, spaghettify it out of the back? Yeah, so let's, you know, let's make small ones. <laughs> that sounds like a really good idea. Antimatter. Antimatter. Antimatter is so dangerous that if it comes in contact with actual matter, like you, this coffee cup, matter, antimatter and matter touch, boom, like bada boom, a big one. And they've actually created antimatter at the LHC. Now, wait a minute. What do they do with it? You know, it is so dangerous that they have to suspend it in a magnetic chamber so it sits and doesn't touch anything. Think about that. They don't know, but they're just doing it. Dark matter, time travel, right? This is what they're trying to, and they don't know. They are flipping the switch, creating voltages of the equivalent to the sun, accelerating these particles, and ramming them into each other just to see what would happen. Now, have they opened up portals to other dimensions? Have they let entities in? Have, have, have these portals open and, and they didn't close them fast enough? I'm, I'm merely making suggestions here. But the actual results of this, they don't know what's going to happen until after it's done. I can only say... That since 2008, this has been a different planet. Strangeness. And that's the LHC. I'm going to do a program on the LHC. And I, all I can say is, since 2008, Nick Redfern has written his best books. I'm just saying. Is that a coincidence? I don't think that it is. And tonight, Nick is with us. I am going to take a quick break. I want you to stay right there. This is Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. I'm the Game Changer and UnX Networks. This is Fade to Black. Tonight, Nick Redfern. Tomorrow night, Nick Pope. Thursday night is another Fader night with open lines all night long. Stay right there. I'll be right back after the short break with our guest, Nick Redfern. This is Nicole Church, daughter of you know who, and you're listening to Fade to Black on JimmyChurchRadio.com and the Game Changer Network. You're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the X. You're listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fade to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. 
Introducing the Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of Fade to Black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. This is the only way forward. This is Fade to Black. Make contact. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can get our podcast for just $2 per month. All you have to do is click on the podcast banner over at jimmychurchradio.com. Hello, Fader Knots. Jimmy Church here. You've seen me with my thunderstorm. Now you can purify the air in your home and get healthy, clean, fresh smelling air and eliminate odors just like I do right here in the bunker. The Eden Pier Thunderstorm uses oxy technology that naturally sends out O3 molecules into the air, which seek out odors and air pollutants in your home and destroys them. It's called a thunderstorm because it purifies the air just like after a thunderstorm. And right now, you can save $200 on an Eden Pier Thunderstorm 3 pack for whole home protection. With this special offer, you're getting three units for under $200. Seriously. Go to EdenPureDeals.com and use Fader 3. Shipping is free and it's easy. Just scroll down. You'll see my name right there, Jimmy Church. Click on it and get your deal today. That's EdenPureDeals.com. Do you have an interest in the paranormal? Then you'll love the UnXNetwork.com. The X is your streaming audio and video for everything supernatural, strange, and mysterious, like UFOs, Bigfoot, ghosts, and so much more. From hosts like Jimmy Church, Whitley Strieber, Micah Hanks, and Christina Gomez, visit the UnXNetwork.com show page for a complete list of all the paranormal programs you'll find on the X. Be sure to follow us on Twitter for updates at KUNXDB. Follow our Facebook group, UnX Network. Find the podcast on Spotify, iHeart, Audible, and Apple Podcast. It's time. It's new. It's the X. 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 Right now, the world couldn't be more chaotic. History shows us what gold does when the world goes crazy. It goes up in value. Right now, we're in unprecedented times. The pandemic, the war in Ukraine, the devaluation of the U.S. dollar. Gold and other precious metals are a defense measure against the hyperinflation that's happening right now. So what can you do to protect yourself? Call my friend Alan Johnson at United Gold Group. He's dedicated to helping people secure their retirement income. He'll help you with gold, with silver, and other precious metals and show you how to set up your own self-directed IRA. Safe and secure, United Gold Group makes gold ownership easy and affordable. There couldn't be a better time, so call now and get a silver American Eagle proof set with a qualified IRA. Call 800-753-8534. That's 800-753-8534. Three, four, or visit unitedgoldgroup.com. Reach out to my friend, Alan Johnson. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show on the Game Changer Radio Network. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to jimmychurchradio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Manson. You're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Nick Redfern is with us. I guess this week, it's the week of the two Nicks. Tonight, Nick Redfern. Tomorrow night, Nick Pope is with us. Tonight, 
We're going to discuss our strange world. We're going to try to hit everything tonight. UFOs, time travel, uh, chupacabra, Bigfoot, conspiracies, ghost, lost history, Mothman, men in black, right? Bigfoot. Nick has written about all of it because he works full-time as an author, a lecturer, and a journalist. He writes about a wide range of unsolved mysteries, and uh, his books include, for nobody's eyes only, Monster Files, The World's Weirdest Places, The Pyramids and the Pentagon, Keep Out, The Real Men in Black, The NASA Conspiracies, Contactees, and Memoirs of a Monster Hunter. He writes uh, for different magazines around the world and Mysterious Universe. He has appeared on numerous television shows, including Fox News, The History Channel's Ancient Aliens, Monster Quest, UFO Hunters, VH1's Legend Hunters, National Geographic Channel's The Truth About UFOs and Paranorm- uh, Paranatural, and BBC's Out of This World, MSNBC's Countdown, and Sci-Fi Channel's Proof Positive. He's done every TV show except mine and i would like to welcome back to fade to black the one and only nick redfern nick how you doing my man hey jimmy it's good good to you. <laughs> um i'm gonna let everybody know uh nick uh lives in texas where they do not have the internet yet uh but nick uh soon though the state <laughs> is going to join the rest of us well, it's, uh, <laughs> that's not quite true, but um, I've had, um, the last couple of days, I've had some problems uh, with the internet and signals, and you know it, but um, I think we kind of, between us, figured it out um, to the extent that we could, but uh, but those things happen, you know, one at a time, so. <laughs> well, you know, it, it, we're, we're just going old school, and uh, we're doing a... Uh, uh, the the way radio should be theater of the mind theater of the mind it's great to have you back i have uh my zz top shirt on tonight for the great state of texas and of course music and and everything else and <laughs> and that's what happens when uh, nick redfern is on the show nick um i i kind of want to start out here um with you um, I spoke uh, about CERN I- at the beginning of the show tonight. And CERN, you know, the Large Hadron Collider, it-, it came online in 2008. And I'm of the opinion that since 2008, the world has been a different place, right? <laughs> and and it has have you had uh, more things to write about since CERN came online? Is it, are we are we in the middle of high strangeness, uh, quite possibly uh, from the the CERN and the LHC activity? Have you ever thought about that? Um, actually, no, I haven't. <laughs> uh, I haven't really dug deeply into the the CERN issue. Um, <clears throat> although you know, you brought up Texas. I mean. Um, you know, there was actually a, a Texas um, aspect con- uh, connected to uh, CERN at one point, and uh, before they shut it all down. So, uh, did Texas had a collider? Yes. Yeah. And where yeah. was it? I, I think there's five in the United States, and most people don't know that. We have we have five here. We have one outside of Chicago. We have one in. In San Francisco, you know, Lawrence Livermore. Um, I think there's one in New Jersey. That's three. I mean, I can look it up. So uh, number four or five was in, in Texas? Yeah. Um, but at least it was it was a, um, sort of um, tied to it, to put it that way. Yeah. And when, um, again, um, I am, I'm of the... A uh, firm belief that things have been activated, and I don't, I don't know what it, what it is, you know. But we can look at, you know, crazy stuff like, you know, the Mandela effect, right? Um, now UFOs are in the news and, and being cited where uh, by official outlets. We haven't had that before. Um, uh, and the world has just been tipped upside down, and I'm not sure why. What what what's the deal with all of the supernatural and the paranormal going on all at the same time? 
Um, well, it's a good uh, it's a good question. Um, I think a lot of it comes down to one thing: that the human race we're just a violent um, species, and you know, things we can do, we'll do it. You know, I mean, we're at war here and there. You know, there's viruses all over the place. You know, um, you know, you put all that together. And, you know, it's no wonder that people are sort of, you know, having meltdowns and things like that. Um, you know, and uh, you think back, say, 10, 12, 15 years ago, you know, I mean, there's always problems and whatever. But if you think, look at things now, I mean, it's sort of doubled and multipled uh, as well, you know. So I think we can say for sure that you know, the world or civilization is kind of, you know, going down a path that um, re we really shouldn't be going down. But, and that path is like meltdown, you know. You know, there's so many people. I mean, all these people shooting other people for no reason at all, you know. I mean, it's just it's craziness, you know. Yeah, and and um, I want to start off with uh, UFOs, and but but here's the deal: um, I I I wonder, and many do, uh, how are they getting here? You know, are they traveling faster than the speed of light? Are they using wormholes? Are they just on a ship for a hundred thousand years and and in cruise control? Uh, is it a nuts and bolts thing? Is it crafts that are showing up here? Are they interdimensional? And we wonder about all of these different things. Is it some technology that we don't understand? And years ago, um, you said you were on a panel that I was hosting, and you said something that I have never forgotten. Um, I asked you that question. I asked the entire panel the question. I think you were sitting next to Stanton Friedman, right? And uh, and you said, well, Jimmy, it, it may not be what you think. Maybe they're already here. Maybe they have a base on the moon. And I turned to you and I said, that's an original thought. And you said, no, my dad told me that. <laughs> right now, do you do you remember? Do you remember answering that question like that? Um, vaguely, <laughs> I think, but. But um, in relation to the question itself, I would be very surprised if, um, you know, the the sort of the linear way to get from there to here and, and so on, I would be very surprised if things go down that way. I think it is, it is something along the lines of sort of um, uh, portals, that kind of thing, you know, to allow you to get from point A to point Z um, in very short <clears throat> in times, in short times, I would be very surprised if it was like, you know, okay, well, let's just hit the accelerator and we'll just go that direction. <laughs> you know, it's not going to be anything um, sort of um, just straight line like that at all. So, yeah, I think either... I think there's a possibility that there could be sort of an extraterrestrial presence somewhere, you know, very close to us. Or if that's not the answer, the other answer is something along the lines of getting to here from there and so on. But in incredible times. Are you uh, you've been writing about this for so long and, and doing your research? Um, are you surprised by some of the comments uh, from our own government and military that this this phenomenon, whatever it is, uh, may not be interstellar, that it may be here. It may be a civilization that that exists in our oceans and somewhere that uh, avoids us and humanity, but they live alongside of us. Are you surprised by those kind of comments coming from official sources? Not really. I mean, if you think um, Ivan Sanderson, uh, way back in the 1960s, um, came up with this scenario that what if, you know, these UFOs were seen in the sky? 
what if they are actually um, living um, deep in the op- um, deep in the oceans? Um, and I think that's an intriguing scenario. You know, we're looking for them. All, when I say them, you know, whatever they are, mm-hmm. um, you know, we're looking for them all the time. Maybe they've been on our planet for who knows for how long. And uh, maybe they can consider our world their world as, as well. I mean, if you look at, for example, the Space Brothers in the 1950s, you know, um, tied with the, the contactee phenomenon. Um, if you look at a lot of those early 1950 stories from the contactees, um, you can find a lot of accounts where the Space Brothers come across like these, to some degree, they're kind of like bullying characters, you know, lay down your nuclear weapons, don't do this. We want you to do this and that. And it's like, well, hang on a minute, it's our planet. Well, <laughs> well, maybe it is their planet. So I think, you know, we need to kind of sort of go away from just the black and white angle. There are aliens here and they're coming from a different planet. I think it's far more difficult. I mean, you mentioned, for example, you know, with our, our government and what they think about it. And of course, you know, if you look back um, sort of 2017, you know, when we all these stories started to uh, surface about government agencies that were going to be become a bit more open in terms of what they're doing in relation to the UFO phenomenon. And then, of course, you know, this all got tied in with the... <clears throat> you know, things like the skinwalker uh, phenomenon, which brings kind of like a supernatural, even an an occult aspect to this. Um, You know, if you look at, for example, you know, a lot of the stories um, in the last couple of years, you know, there's there's been government people and military people investigating all these phenomena and then falling sick and seeing things like shadow people and things like that, you know, where what we're we're dealing with something that isn't really just, I think, um, just sort of an extraterrestrial phenomenon. And it may not be extraterrestrial at all. You know, it could be interdimensional, multidimensional. But um, I've always felt, well, not always, but for, for a long time I've felt that the the UFO f- phenomenon has a parallel um, with the extraterrestrial angle, and um, and it may be to their um, their work, if you like, to to present themselves as extraterrestrial when they may be multidimensional, but it but it works well for them to pretend to be extraterrestrials you know there could be a lot of sort of um you know sort of a a lot of playing around you know with with what this person said and what that person said and so on you know do do you believe that the government actually knows what's going on right and and I'm i'm being direct here you know because we don't know we don't have the answers to the phenomenon you know we don't we don't have we don't know what's going or is it the opposite of that is that just what they're saying publicly but do you believe that they fully are cognizant that they understand exactly what is happening no i what i think is that Government agencies over the last 10 years, thereabouts, or perhaps a little bit less than that, um, you know, all these uh, revelations that are coming out, again, like Skinwalker, ATIP, all that kind of stuff. Um, with all that coming out, I think there is a, a realization that, yes, there is a phenomenon, and yes, something is coming here. But that doesn't mean in the slightest that it has to be extraterrestrial and it doesn't mean they have to be friendly or not friendly you know we don't really know um and i think at the best 
based on all that I've read in the last sort of five years, you know, when all these revelations started to come out and whatever, like Harry Reid and things like that, um, I've sort of got the 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 approach, if you like, that we know something, but that doesn't mean they're friendly and it doesn't mean there has to be a positive an agenda. I mean, you know, it, we just don't really have many answers. And I don't think for one reason at all do they uh, do we know where they're coming from. You know, I think, um, you know, I think the word alien, we can use it because they, you know, I guess they are aliens, you know. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're extraterrestrial. But for whatever reason, I think a lot of people want it to be extraterrestrial. But I, I think it's more of, kind of something along the lines of a, like a multidimensional thing. And, uh, and like I said, it, it may not be um, something that, that's on our side. I mean, that may not be what we want to hear, but, but it might be what we will hear. And it could be, Nick, all of the above. Right. Well, that's true. That's true. It could be. It could be ET. It could be uh, interdimensional. It could be time travelers, us from the future. It could be a parallel civilization living alongside us here on Earth. It could be all everything. uh, Trying to pigeonhole any of this into one specific category. I think that's the mistake. There are billions of, of Earth-like planets just in our Milky Way. Billions in the Goldilocks zone, right? I, uh, how many of those are visiting Earth? And none of them would look the same. Everything would be different, right? Yeah, and I think um, and I think that demonstrates um, one of the most important things. You know, going back to 1947 when the whole flying saucer phenomenon began. And then comparing that to where we are now in 2022, well, although we've got a lot of um, a lot of more testimony and data and accounts from people, we really haven't got answers to the phenomenon, and um, and that's an unfortunate thing. But I do sometimes wonder: is it being deliberately helped um, held back from us? Um, you know, it's hard to say, but I mean, again, sort of going back to the Skinwalker Ranch and everything like that, which has started to come out further, uh, more and more, you know, and you've got people falling sick, you know, in the, in the military and in government offices who are working in these programs. Um, now, whether it's deliberate or not, but there's a lot of negativity as well in these um these events and incidents what whatever the truth may be and i'm not uh, please everybody listen to my words whatever the truth may be there is no way that the government could tell us what it is what (laughs) you know what i mean whatever the truth may be it's interdimensional beings uh living among us they can't say that to the world It'd be better if they just said aliens are here. You can't, you know what I mean? You can't, the truth, I don't think there's any way that the government could find a way to, uh, to let us know without having uh, extreme panic and freak out. Well, yeah. And I think one of the important things that, that I sort of started to get into probably round about 15, close to 20 years ago, maybe, that I realized that it wasn't just extraterrestrial, but what there was was sort of like um, a blending of the extraterrestrial with not just paranormal, but also with the occult as well. I mean, for example, perfect classic example, like um, the great beast, Alistair Crowley. I mean, he invoked this entity called LAM, L-A-M. Now, if you Google L-A-M, um, Lamb, and Alistair Crowley, and have a look at what um, Lamb looked like. Lamb look just looks like the creature on the front of Whitley Strieber's communion book. 
and um, it's it's literally almost identical. And uh, and this was um, this was all down to Alistair Crowley, as I said, invoking this entity from some other realm. Um, so for me, and of course you you'll know or remember my book um, Final Events, which um, came out about uh, fifteen years ago. Uh, which talked about a, a, a group kind of like these other A-type, A-type uh, kind of organizations where they were looking into the so-called demonic side of the UFO phenomenon. And um, and I think a lot of people in government, in the military, in the intelligence community are now becoming to see that there is this Yes, there's an extraterrestrial or an alien angle, however you want to term it, but there is some kind of supernatural aspect at time, sort of tied to it. Um, before we get to the break, I am going to, uh, just in case uh, people may not be familiar with uh, who Lamb is, uh, let me bust this up on the screen. That's Lamb. And now this was, um, I, was this 1932, I believe? Yeah, this was decades and decades and decades ago. Yeah. And, um, and, <clears throat> and Crowley um, essentially invoked Lamb. And, um, and this was not done by, you know, sort of aiming telescopes to the sky, you know, and saying, come on down, you know. Give us, you know, give us the truth or whatever. It was nothing like that at all. You know, this was totally driven around the supernatural and the paranormal. And yet you could you could make a case that Lamb and, as I said, the creature on the front of communion, you look at the two of them, you know, it could be um, brother and sister, you know. <laughs> I, 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 I don't think or brother and brother, mate. Yeah, yeah. Kind of I don't think there's any question about. It. I mean, when you look at Lamb, what what pops into your head, right? And but mm -hmm. the the fact that uh, uh, Crowley uh, uh, drew this picture, um, I, I think it's 1932. It might have been uh, just before that, but that was uh, what 15 years before Roswell. Number one. And number two, the first kind of gray descriptions, that probably goes all the way up to 1961 with Betty and Barney Hill. Um, and so that would have been 30 years after uh, Aleister Crowley. And not many people knew, unless you were in Crowley's circles, uh, knew about Lamb. Lamb, we know about Lamb now in, in popular culture, of course. But back then, nobody would have seen uh, the images of Lamb. Uh, certainly not 1947, 54, 58, 61, right? Yeah. And there's actually something else that a lot of people don't know about Alistair Crowley. He used to have a house at Loch Ness, Scotland, uh, called Beleskin House. And, um, and, and Crowley was involved, again, in all sorts of um, mystical activity. Um, when, he was, when he lived... At, um, at Loch Ness and I think I, I don't think it's um, just a coincidence that we've got um, Crowley um, UFOs Loch Ness, strange creatures in Loch Ness um, which a lot of people think the, the Loch Ness monsters are supernatural creatures, you know you put all this together you know and you and Crowley pops up here, and he pops up there, and he pops up at Loch Ness, and then with, with, with the cover of Communion, you know, to me, all of this, you know, puts a thread together, and, and which they become multiple threads. And, um, and, uh, and I actually wrote a book on the about the Loch Ness monster called Nessie, which talks about all of the supernatural side of Crowley, and. Um, and Loch Ness and, and how it all ties in. And um, people might be surprised in terms of whether this really is extraterrestrial or something even far more stranger than we can really figure it out. 
And let's take our break right here. And the other part right. about uh, Crowley and that house, Jimmy Page bought it. That's right, he did. Yeah, yeah Jimmy Page bought it. Our guest tonight. Yeah, that's right. That's <laughs> yeah, true. Absolutely. Our guest tonight, Nick Redfern. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, we're talking about our strange world. By the way, Count Popper just posted that the the lamb drawing was 1918. Incredible. This is Fade to Black. We'll be right back. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network. Your one million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse, KUNX DB. DX. Hello, Fader Knots. Jimmy Church here. You've seen me with my thunderstorm. Now you can purify the air in your home and get healthy, clean, fresh smelling air and eliminate odors just like I do right here in the bunker. The Eden Pier Thunderstorm uses oxy technology that naturally sends out O3 molecules into the air, which seek out odors and air pollutants in your home and destroys them. It's called a thunderstorm because it purifies the air just like after a thunderstorm. And right now, you can save $200 on an Eden Pier Thunderstorm 3 pack for whole home protection. With this special offer, you're getting three units for under $200. Seriously. Go to EdenPureDeals.com and use Fader 3. Shipping is free and it's easy. Just scroll down. You'll see my name right there, Jimmy Church. Click on it and get your deal today. That's EdenPureDeals.com. This is Billy Carson, founder and CEO of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv is the fastest growing and one of the most watched networks in the world. And I would like to personally invite you to check out our expanding library of TV, film, lectures, and special presentations. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv has over 6,000 videos covering lost history, health, UFOs, spirituality, and our future. We are committed to our community. And with my personal invitation, you can right now get your own free 30-day membership at Forbidden ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Your own library of information starts today at ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Because you never got that pony you always wanted. <laughs> Damn it. Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network. Listen, I know and you know that you've always wanted your first crystal skull. Or maybe you're a collector just like me, but you just don't know where to go to find the real thing. Then I met Carolyn Ford over at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. Carolyn is the guardian of Einstein, one of the most respected ancient crystal skulls in the world. All of her unique skulls have been imprinted sitting with Einstein in his sacred lodge and are carved from the finest gemstone and materials. Imprinting is the process of receiving the ancient wisdom from the master skull or master computer. Einstein, the ancient crystal skull. To see Carolyn's current collection of crystal skulls, just visit her store at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com or click on the banner over on our site. Don't forget to use the promo code JIMMY at checkout to receive 10% off of your order today. That's promo code JIMMY. Finding your first or next crystal skull is easy. Just visit EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. Hello, I'm and you're listening to my main man, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Hi, this is Ray Sobs here, repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. <laughs> We're of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can become an official Fader Knot by just going to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. Hello, this is Serena Wright Taylor from Conscious Life Expo, and you're listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church, who holds the lucky pony record for the best astrological chart since 1963. 
True story. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Our Strange World with Nick Redfern. I got to say, um, I, I've got most of Nick's books, and I have uh, the honor and the privilege uh, to get uh, advanced copies of each one when it comes out. And every time, Nick, uh, that I get a book, I'm like, how does he do it? <laughs> right? How does he do it? But here's here's the thing. Um, we live in a, on a, on a very strange planet, man. And there's strange stuff going on all the time. You don't have a well that's going to run dry. Do you? It's always, it's always out there. (laughs) Well, that's true, I guess. But, um, but I mean, when I'm writing books, you know, it's, it's, it's not sort of a, a big issue really. I mean, um, I usually do a book. Um, sort of about 75,000 words. And, um, you know, I work from home and uh, I work nine to five. You know, I don't uh, work at weekends um, or evenings. Um, I just do nine to five, uh, Monday to Friday, um, because I like, you know, to have a, a, you know, a a normal life as well, or or as normal as it can be. (laughs) And... um, um, but, you know, you have to be sort of, um, you know, sort of make sure that, um, you know, if you're going to do this, you are you are going to sit down and you're going to get it done. And um, and that's an important thing, you know. Um, for me, it's a passion, but it's also, you know, something where I take the approach of, of a working day as well. And... Um, and I think that's the best, for me at least, that's the best way to sort of a- approach the research, the writing, and and liaising with the publisher and so on. And it, when when it comes to, uh, when, when I think about you, Nick, I do think about cryptozoology uh, first. And I, well, no, I think of DRI, the band. Um, I think yeah. of, I think of Manchester first. But then after that, um, I, I, I think about cryptozoology and your coverage on that. And so when we, when we use that broad term, um, is, is Bigfoot underneath that, uh, along with, you know, the chupacabra are, are, would you consider that cryptozoology as well? Well, yeah, I mean, this, that's a good point because a lot of people in the field of cryptozoology, and maybe for people who haven't heard of that, it's the the, stu- the study of unknown animals. You know, we're talking like we've heard earlier about the Loch Ness monster, and, um, and you mentioned Bigfoot and Chupacabra, things like that. And um, and for me, uh, I think again there's sort of like a paranormal or a strange aspect to just about all of these creatures. However, on the other side of the coin, a lot of cryptozoologists will say, no, these are just unknown animals. Well, they're wrong. You know, you know, I'm sure they're wrong. For example, with Bigfoot. I mean, the Bigfoot creatures are seen all across the United States. You know, they're sort of typically seven foot seven foot five they've been seen all over the place and we cannot catch one of them we've never captured one you know um and people say occasionally they've seen them vanish in front of them almost like in the predator mover movie you know with um, arnold schwarzenegger where they just vanish um and you think the the sheer scale of the population of the United States, and there are these seven foot giants in the United States, and we cannot catch one. You know, I don't. I, you know, I'm not asking for twenty or thirty Bigfoots to you know to be studied. One will do. You know, <laughs> yeah. 
But we can't. No, there's no planet. Uh, there's no animal on the planet, if you like, um, apart from the Bigfoot creatures, which um, evade us on every single occasion, and they never get shot. The photographs are always usually, usually blurry, and when you put all that together, you have to realize that there's something wrong there. And it's the same with like the Mothman story. You know, there's there's clear paranormal aspects surrounding the uh, the Mothman story in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, back in the 1960s. And um, you brought up the the Chupacabra. Well, I've been on many expeditions to. Um, to Puerto Rico, investigating the original um, chupacabras and the so-called Texas chupacabras as well, which, by the way, are actually different different things. But um, one of the things I've found on every time um, that I've been to Puerto Rico, I've got a lot of really weird stories where people have said that the, the chupacabras were sort of shapeshifters. In other words, they could alter their appearances and um and when you start to go down those pathways and um and take on different forms that kind of things again we're we're not just talking about unknown animals we're talking about something that really isn't really an animal at least not in the uh, in the way in which we use the terminology here's the deal millions of people cannot be suffering from some crazy psychosis and hallucinations. You know, that's the part, whether it's Chupacabra or Bigfoot and Bigfoot's been sighted all around the world, right? It's just not here in the United States. But if you go and Nick, you know, this, if you go up to uh, Northern uh, California all the way up uh, to Washington State, that corner, mm-hmm. the northwest United States, everybody has got a Bigfoot sighting. Everybody's got a Bigfoot story. It, and, and we're talking about millions of people. Um, and you can go up there and try to talk UFOs. And, eh, you know, but you want to bring up Bigfoot? Everybody's got a Bigfoot story. And it doesn't matter uh, who it is. And, and a Bigfoot sighting, and it can't be psychosis. Something is going on. No. What it comes down to is that whatever these animals are, they're not just missing um, unknown animals. Right. I'm not even sure they are actually animals. You know? Right, right, um, right, right, right. It's, it's hard to say, but, uh, but the, there's no doubt in my mind um, you know, there's there's no doubt that they exist. You know, they're out there. But the problem is, so many people in the cryptozoology arena are essentially um, approaching this, um, the search for these creatures, as if they're they're you know if they're looking for a bear or a polar bear or a penguin or something, you know. Um, But that's not the way to do it. What we have to do is realize that there does seem to be a blending between the paranormal and Bigfoot and um, the UFO phenomenon and the occult and the paranormal. And I think um, if we would only do this, what we should do, is to realize that all of this stuff has to be blended together. And I think that eventually would give us the answers. But the problem is there's so many people in the cryptozoological field, um, you know, filled with egos and basically saying, oh, you know, I'm the Bigfoot guy and the other ones, I'm the Nessie guy, that kind of thing. Well, let's all just get together and try and figure out, you know, not what these creatures are, but why Alistair Crowley had a house at Loch Ness, you know, <laughs> right. that kind of thing. <laughs> um, Eddie just posted up. He said, uh, blurry Bigfoot pics may be the result of the re- radiation field they create. Gimlin, you know, the Gimlin Patterson film was on eight millimeter film. That's a really, really, really good point. That's actually quite strong. I, I, I like that comment. I have, I have been on the fence um, uh, with Bigfoot. 
I, I, I just don't know. Right. And I've always thought of uh, something biological, right. An undiscovered species, but why haven't we hit one with a car yet? Right. What, yeah. why hasn't okay. that happened? Okay. But right. I, I agree with that. But the other side of me says there's way too many sightings. So the phenomenon is real, but I've been leaning, I've been leaning more interdimensional, you know, that there's another aspect to Bigfoot that we just simply just don't understand. The phenomenon is real, but it just may not be biological. And, and, and I agree with you. If, if that, if that happens, right, if something is proven, how do you think that, uh, that is going to happen. Is that going to be from physics? Is it going to be from science? What what's going to what's going to prove the phenomenon? Yeah, Nate, you're right, and those are all the, the sort of the key issues which are starting to to come to the fore now. I mean, a good example, you know, we mentioned briefly earlier with the uh, you know the Skinwalker uh, phenomenon, and I've investigated that quite often. Um, several occasions on TV shows and, um, and, and expeditions of my, my own. And, you know, when you start to look into the whole skinwalker aspect, you know, or, or phenomenon, and you start to hear these stories of people falling sick and, you know, they go to bed and then they wake up in the middle of the night with like a skinwalker sort of looming over the bed. And yet... They also they also saw sort of strange balls of light in the sky above. I mean, you know, it's hard to to determine how that can all happen, but it does. And um, but I think now we're we're beginning to see. You know, when you, when you said uh, Jimmy about when you said about you know how can this be with you know, in relation to Bigfoot, you know, where they look like giant apes, but you've got all these different aspects kind of, you know, surrounding them. And uh, and I think now we are beginning to see that, um, you know, it is, we shouldn't really be sort of calling ourselves cryptozoologists and, and ufologists or ghost hunters. We should just be investigators of the weird if you like or something like that but by by sort of just putting us in one um angle and into something else into another angle you know it sort of um keeps us apart and that's the last thing we really need we want to be a or we should be able to um figure out and put all the pieces together rather than give each other little pieces here and there now, what about, and this is like going, you know, completely uh, out there. Do you, do you think that there is a connection between UFO sightings and Bigfoot sightings? Oh, yeah. There's, a, there's, there's dozens of cases like that. Um, I don't know if you know Stan Gordon. I don't know if you ever had him on your, on, your, on your show. But Stan, uh, who lives in Pennsylvania, he actually wrote an entire book on um, the UFO Bigfoot connection, and the book's called Silent Invasion, and um, and that's a really good book, and it talks about how um, the UFO phenomenon um, blends together uh, with the Bigfoot phenomenon, and I would uh, for anybody who may have seen a UFO at the same and local and locale as Bigfoot, you know, I would de definitely recommend that people um, read um, Stan's book, uh, Silent Invasion. That's a really good one. Hey, but again, the problem is so many cryptozoologists just will not deal with the UFO angle. They're just like, you know, those people are on crack or whatever, you know. Yeah, <laughs> when, any, when anybody says, and that includes you, Nick, <laughs> you're not off the list. When but any, I'm on crack. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, <laughs> but whenever anybody says, um, I have the answers, I know, I yeah. run. I run. I, 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 I don't have time for that. <laughs> I, I really don't. Nobody has the answers. And what about, like, Diatlov Pass? Right. Is that the perfect scenario of uh, UFO sightings, light in the sky and then mm -hmm. 
uh, a Sasquatch situation on the ground happening uh, at, at the very same time. Well, yeah, and and I mean, if you look um, throughout the world, you know, we've got Bigfoot, um, we've got the Yeti in um, in the Himalayas, um, but there's a lot of other ape-like creatures in the world, um, and a lot of them have weird aspects to them as well. For example, um, in Sumatra, uh, where they have a, a smaller um, ape-like creature called Orang Pendek, and um, and some people claim to have seen these creatures um, sort of turn invisible. And you can find a lot of cases like that through Native American uh, legends as well. Um, these hairy creatures in the 1800s, which would just vanish. So, you know, you can find not um, Bigfoot type creatures that just vanish in the United States, but also in different parts of the United States and the rest of the world as well. So I think a lot of these unknown apes, which are, you know, eerily elusive to us, um, I think most of them have a paranormal aspect um, attached to them. And I, I do want to mention the panda. And the reason why, you know, because uh, the panda was like a rumor, right? It was yeah. a mythological creature. And yeah. and then it was found in the bamboo forest of China. Um, but this is a modern story. And if, if something doesn't want to be found or want to be seen, it can it, it can avoid us if it wants to, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, you, you're right. I mean, the panda is a classic example. I mean, it's, you know, barely uh, more than, you know, a century before the, um, or, or after I should say, the, um, the, the pan when the panda was found, you know. And I mean, the African gorilla. I mean, that, it's, that was, was um, you know, a rumor at one point, you know, and, and, um, and not very long ago either, you know. So some animals, you know, uh, large animals, they can elude us, but, you know, uh, I, I can accept it as just a normality thing if they're just large animals, you know, running into the woods and hiding out because, you know, most animals have, um, you know, um, better, um, you know, odor, um, hearing, um, you know, hearing things, all this, they're all very much more, more advanced than us. However, in saying that, there's all this other aspect of these creatures just missing. And by just missing, I mean like the click of a finger, you know. And um, and if there's a seven-foot Bigfoot behind you and then it's just gone in seconds, you know, there is something wrong there. Um but um, but that's part of part of the parcel of the uh, the story. Um but so many people just like I said, just don't wanna know. Um, you know, they're just it's like Stan uh, Friedman. You know, Stan was a great guy, but he was so stubborn about stubborn about the MJ twelve documents. Now these are real, you know, this is the, this is a real deal. And um One you know, one thing that um uh, fascinates me. I brought up the Pacific Northwest, but if you go up there and uh, you you stop for gas and you go in to any Quick Mart gas station and you're going to see a rack of Bigfoot T-shirts, right? You're going to yeah. see the Bigfoot sculptures. And it's not like at one place. It's every place you go. It's everywhere. So I go to a Bigfoot museum. I'm on Coast to Coast. I'm hosting Coast to Coast AM, right? I go to this Bigfoot, uh, uh, huge, thousands of statues and things. And and one of the workers there, uh, one of the managers comes up and we're having a conversation. And and um, I said, uh, do you guys have any UFO stuff here? She goes, what? You know, like a UFO T-shirt? She goes, what do you mean? I said, look, I'm, I'm the host of uh, Coast to Coast AM. She goes, what's that? I said, never mind, right? But and, and now, how crazy is that? 
There was no UFO conversation, no UFO T-shirts, but she could have told me anything about Bigfoot, and I could have got Bigfoot socks, underwear, coffee mugs, keychains, uh, which I did buy, uh, all of the above, but no UFO conversation, and she had never heard of Coast to Coast AM. And, and that's the Pacific Northwest. It's incredible to me. Yeah, you know, that, that's interesting. You know, I kind of love the understand to sort of people's views and opinions, you know, on this and on that. But um, but I just I just wish more than anything else, people would just be open minded rather than saying, you know, something like, "I'm the the yeti guy," you know, mm-hmm. and he's this and. This is the dog man guy, that kind of thing. You know, I mean, we need to get answers rather than just strut around saying, yeah, I'm do, I do this one and you do that and whatever. It, but isn't everything okay? I, this was my opening question uh, for the show tonight, um, but I delayed it to now. Isn't everything connected? Right? Is every book that you have written, I don't care if it's Marilyn Monroe or Chupacabra. Mm-hmm. Right? Is it all connected? Well, yeah. Yeah, I think it is because, I mean, again, I mean, John Keel, you know, I mean, a lot of people in the field, you know, uh, sort of frowned on Keel, but they really shouldn't have because he was one of the early people who demonstrated how and why um, that strange phenomena could be seen collectively over and over again in the same areas. Now, in other words, you know, in one area of forest, people see Bigfoot and bright lights and they see like a ghostly figure all within, say, about four miles. You know, something like that is just, that that is just not doable unless there is a, a paranormal aspect to it. And... And there's no doubt that Keel was one of the first who demonstrated as to there was this absolute connection between all the different aspects of um, you know the <clears throat> of the of this phenomenon. And for people who haven't read um, Keel's books, I think you know most people will know him of his book, um, The Mothman Prophecies, but. Um, Keel did um, several other really good ones. Um, the best one, for me at least, is um, Operation Trojan um, Horse. And um, and that demonstrates, again, how, you know, you can get, you can stumble in the woods uh, where somebody's seen a UFO and two weeks later, a Bigfoot stumbles through in the same area. And Keel realized that this, you know, the chances of this happening just, um, you know, just on their own, again, it's just not doable. Let's take our break right here. Our guest tonight, Nick Redfern. We are talking about our strange world. We've got a lot more to cover. We're going to do all of that next after this short break. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black. Stay with us. Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. You're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the X. ¿Qué tal mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carson, el tiburón, y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. Claro que sí. The Believer is the chilling true story of Dr. John Mack, a renowned Harvard psychiatrist and Pulitzer Prize winner. This is an outreach program from the cosmos to the consciously impaired. He risked it all to investigate human encounters with aliens. The Believer, Alien Encounters, Hard Science, and The Passion of John Mack. 
written by award-winning former New York Times journalist and author Ralph Blumenthal. Now available in paperback from High Road Books. Introducing the Game Changer Blend from River Moon Coffee that delivers a customized blend made specifically for the fader knots. If the game is rigged, change the game. It's a bolder cup with some bite. Game Changer is the coffee of choice for those that prefer an organic dark roast that is slightly lighter and milder, but it's still dark. With wild notes of pecans and chocolate with a rich, balanced, full-bodied cup that is roasted to perfection for a great coffee to start your day as an after-dinner coffee or anywhere in between. Artisan, small batch, roasted to perfection. USDA certified organic, all River Moon coffee is freshly roasted and packaged in the USA. Just go to rivermooncoffee.com or click on the banners over on our site and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. rivermooncoffee.com Do you want to be an official fade or not? Of course you do. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Just go to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. Fader Knots, when you think about the future of our country and where we're headed, do you wonder about the food supply? I do. Disruptions in the food supply chain could be disastrous, and they usually occur with little warning. That's why the smartest thing you can do today is to stockpile emergency food, water, and other essentials. I personally recommend My Patriot Supply. They're the nation's largest emergency preparedness company, serving millions of customers for more than a decade. In fact, they're the only source my family trusts for our preparedness plan. You should too. Right now, save 20% off a full four-week supply of delicious meals that provide 2,000 calories a day. Saving 20% helps too, doesn't it? Especially now. So go to preparewithjimmy.com and get ready. That's preparewithjimmy.com. There's no time to lose. Do it now. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. You listen to us, and we listen to you. And so does the CIA. (laughs) Hi, I'm Ray Sobs, and I'm here to tell you about something I really think you're going to like. The Unex Network is a part of a larger group called Unex Media, and one of the things we offer is the quarterly Unex Magazine, which is available both in print and digital formats. This amazing magazine covers all aspects of the unexplained, and makes for a great coffee table periodical that is certain to spark enlightening conversations in your living rooms. We invite you to check out the latest digital issue for free. Just go to unxnetwork.com forward slash membership and fill out your free membership with your name and email and become a new free member. The new summer issue is now available and the theme is Time Anomalies, which includes a feature article written by our managing editor, Lee Spiegel. Just go to unxnetwork.com Network.com forward slash memberships. That's unxnetwork.com forward slash memberships and get your free e copy of the Unex magazine today. You are listening to Fate to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The Revolution will not be televised. The Revolution is on radio. Ciao. Well, 
Welcome back. Faded Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church tonight. Nick Redfern is with us. We're talking about our strange world. It is strange indeed. I think, well, it's been it's been getting strange since electricity. Uh, I, I, Nick, I, I swear, as soon as we figured out electricity, everything just went bonkers. And, and I'm not sure why. Um, but one of my favorite subjects is the men in black. And you and I have done a few shows on this over the years, but the men in black, and I've had my own experiences, um, and you've written your history on the men in black is, is some of the best. And I use it uh, for references. Uh, the men in black is not a, a modern phenomenon. You know, it, it didn't start with Will Smith, did it? The stories about no, the men didn't. in black go all the way back. Uh, uh, well, Maybe uh, since the Bible was written, if we really take a, a close look at it, but it is part of uh, popular culture, uh, folklore, myths, legend. The men in black have been around for a very long time, haven't they? Yeah, I mean, um, I guess in one sense, you know, when the movies came out back in the 90s, you know, it was... Um, in one sense, it was a good thing because it demonstrated um, the the phenomenon of the men in black to just about everybody. Um, and most people prior to that hadn't heard about the MIB. Um, but in the movies, you know, the good fun, but the, um, the approach um, that was taken was that the MIB were sort of like secret agents wiping out dangerous people aliens um but the reality is very different um i've written um three books um on the men in black uh, now and um and one on the women in black uh, phenomenon and if you speak to practically 95 percent of everyone who's seen the or been terrified by the men in black or the women in black um all of them describe of uh, have them uh, looking really pale skinned um emaciated a lot of them have bulging eyes with uh, these wrap around sunglasses uh designed to hide their eyes um some of them seem to wear um bad fitting wigs and um and they try and find uh, get ways to get into the house which kind of parallels, excuse me, um, parallels the old stories of vampires. You know, you can't, you're not, you cannot come in until you know you're invited. That kind of scenario. Um, so, in reality, the MIB phenomenon again had these um, occult and paranormal overtones attached to them. Now, the guy who really um, began the phenomenon was a guy named Albert Bender uh, who lived in Bridgeport, C Connecticut. And um, and he was someone who um, created a UFO um, organization in <clears throat> in the town. And um, and he, he, he basically put, put this um, organization together and a lot of people began to uh, follow him and so on. And it wasn't long afterwards that uh, one night um, Bender woke up and um, and felt ill, and there was this um, odor of like sulfur um, in the bedroom. And again, um, sulfur is like a classic odor um, that you can in, in, in numerous different stories you know in relation to the the world of the paranormal and he created this organization the international flying saucer bureau and it all went well for a while um but what a lot of people don't know is that bender was also deep into the occult and um he was heavy on ouija boards and um alchemy he, he actually was someone who who knew just about everything about alchemy, and um, and the more and more that um, Bender continued to look into the Men in Black mystery, the MIB 
came to threaten him. And eventually, um, just after a few years, Bender, Albert Bender quit the UFO subject because he too began to fall um, sick, um, paranoid, um, sort of um, just just covered him. You and, know, and, and can, um, I, can I jump in and just make a comment yeah. here? Um, is that uh, one of the things about uh, Albert Bender uh, for me that uh, ne ne always needs to be pointed out was that he he covered the phenomenon. Uh, he wrote the book, started uh, an organization, and and this was all in the early 1950s. The visitation yep. uh, that happened uh, to him was in his home. And he said that the men in black entered his home through the walls, right? That's right. And now, but he didn't, and, and they said to him, shut your mouth, mm -hmm. right? Okay. He doesn't speak about this for 10 years. He just drops out of sight, stops everything that he's doing, and he had, uh, he had uh, what's the word I want to use? He had the poo-poo scared out of him. And it, it was 10 years later. This is a family show, Nick. I, I, when you and I are private, we'll use the right language. But, but here's the deal. 10 years later, that's when he stepped out and said, these guys dressed in black, fedoras, uh, came through the walls and told me to stop talking about UFOs and the phenomenon. And he didn't disclose that for 10 years. That's a very important point to bring out about Albert. He didn't, he did not, um, uh, how do I say that? He didn't sensationalize it. He could have, right? What if he wrote a book on, you know, beings that entered his house and told him to stop talking about the phenomena? He didn't do that. He stayed silent for 10 years, didn't he? Yeah, and, and 1962, he actually did do his own book, uh, Flying Saucers and the Three Men. Um, but, uh, but you're right. I mean, he started into the UFO scene in the early 1950s, but then he got so terrified. Um, he didn't do really anything until 1962. And if you read his book, um, Albert Bender's book, Flying Saucers and the Three Men, that comes across like um, the X Files meets, um, you know, the, the Exorcist or something like that. You know? um, and I mean, I'm not, a, um, I'm not exaggerating. You know, the, it begins as like a UFO book, but throughout the book, you know, there are all these aspects of the occult and the paranormal. And as I said, um, you know, he was heavily into alchemy and Ouija boards, and, and he wasn't a dabbler. You know, he was someone who had a long um, um, knowledge of all these phenomena, these phenomena, and um, so yeah. The for me, at least, you know, the for the whether it's the women in black or the men in black, what fascinates me more than anything else is how the the MIB and the WIB have been sort of um, changed through Hollywood. Um, you know, presenting the presenting them as secret agents when they're just as far away as you could get from secret agents, really. How many how many examples uh, before you say countless because it's it's out there? How many examples are there of the men in black showing up at somebody's house? And and taking evidence, photographs, uh, film, um, any evidence that would be in the house, and and just walking away. And the people that give up, the, they they don't fight it off, right? They'll tell the story later. But how many times has has this happened? Well, that does happen a lot, actually, and um, and sometimes it's almost as if they do it. I won't say for fun, but it was almost as if they've done it for a deliberate reason. I mean, for example, the, probably the, the weirdest and creepiest story um, was presented by John Keel, who we talked about earlier. And um, John Keel um, was told a story about a, a local journalist and uh, uh, Mary Heyer. 
and she was working late one night and this weird creepy little black um suited guy um comes in and threatens her to leave all this MIB research alone and um and as as he's uh, about to leave uh, <clears throat> excuse me where as she's about to leave um this MIB comes in and grabs Mary Hire's pen and runs off. <laughs> it's like a bizarre story. And he's and he's staring at this um ink pen, just amazed at it. As if he had no idea what a pen was. But he looked at it, um, ran out the uh, the door, just almost like giggling. Um and so there are a lot of really sort of eerily odd stories along those lines of um of people having um items confiscated have have you had uh in your research out there on loca- have you had a uh, a men in black experience that you can share um i've had some really weird phone calls like odd phone calls um you know in the dead of night and um like what what happened I, what happened oh well when i was doing i the best one I can think of, and um, and bear in mind, you know, I'm very good with, um, you know, my phone numbers and letting them out and all that kind of stuff. But this was round about um, about 12 or 13 years ago when I was still doing some of the research into the Marilyn Monroe slash UFO um, story that circulates now and again. And um, and I've been some doing research on the the Marilyn story and in about 2 a.m. 2 a.m. in the morning um I could hear this blast in the phone the phone was ringing of course everybody you know if the phone rings out rings out you know in the dead of night you know everybody panics oh god what's happened you know everybody it doesn't matter where you are in the world but everybody thinks that you know um but um so I picked the phone up quickly and at first, all I could hear um, was like what I thought was static, but it was that it wasn't static. It was just so loud. So um, I pulled it away from the um, the earphone for a, a moment. And bear in mind, this was research I was doing on on Marilyn Monroe. And you know that um, the the song that um, Happy Birthday that uh, Marilyn sang to JFK. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, whoever was on the other end of the line, they had recorded it and they played it down my phone number at like two a.m. <laughs> and I'm not and I'm not exaggerating. That was like two a.m. and and the uh, the recording of the JFK um, Marilyn uh, Happy Birthday um, singing, and um, and it was just and this was. Um, as I said, this was right before um, you know I was doing the the Marilyn um, research, and I felt uh, I couldn't prove it, but I, I felt that was some kind of weird, subtle, or less than subtle, um, you know, threat, if you like. Um, no, no caller I, ID. No caller ID. Was it from Washington D.C.? <laughs> no, no. I mean, this this was sort of you know before. Um, smartphones, iPhones. This was this was would have been about about 2000 or 1999. I'd have to check up, but it was around a, in that period. But that was kind of like a, a weird MIB thing, you know, because in so many M- MIB cases, you know, you have these MIB um, leaving weird messages on the phone, or or when they're around, um, there's a lot of static in the phones as well as if you know there's a problem with the phones when the mib suddenly pop up so that that was a a really weird one um out of several (laughs) i um i got a phone call you know in the movies when they whenever they show a phone number it'll be five 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 one two one two right okay i got a phone call came in two oh two five 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 one two one two and 202 is Washington, D.C. Uh, now, who who could possibly have that phone number and why would they use it? 
Now, I'm going to leave that right there. That's for another show or a, a private conversation. But to have that phone number, you've got a juice card, right? You've got, you've got, you've got some, you've got some connections. 202-555-1212. Um, but you just mentioned Maryland and we're talking about men in black. Um, and, and everything being connected. Do you think, uh, that there is a connection to the men in black, Maryland's death, UFOs, JFK, and again, everything is connected? Well, the, there's no doubt that, um, you can find a lot of UFO connections, um, with like things like JFK, and, and Marilyn. I mean, we know that, um, Marilyn had an affair with JFK. Um, we also have, you know, most people have seen it, this um, controversial document um, purported to be a CIA document um, talking about Marilyn and JFK and the UFO phenomenon. Um, and there are a number of people um, who were involved in the JFK assassination um, were tied you know, in relation to, um, to to UFOs as well. Um, for example, the the infamous Maury Island case of a of an alleged crashed UFO in um, on the west coast of the United States. Um, now, one of the guys who was involved in the in the story actually ended up being. Um, been threatened as one of the key figures who may have play, um, may have been uh, one of the assassins of JFK, and uh, you know you, you you can't really get sort of sort of more closer, you know, when you're talking about putting things like JFK and UFOs together. Um, Are you talking but, about um, uh, Fred Chrisman? Yeah, Fred. Yeah, Fred Chrisman was a guy who lived on the um, west coast of the United States, and um, and Fred Chrisman uh, was someone who had a fascination uh, with UFOs because he'd had um, he'd seen like a squadron of UFOs. Now, I'll I'll sort of um, you know sort of um, shorten it down a little bit, but Chrisman um, after JFK. Uh, was shot and killed later on, uh, Chrisman was actually um, fingered, if you like, as being an assassin um, of JFK. And um, <clears throat> and that in itself, you know, is, a, is just one fascinating um, angle, if you like. Yeah, you cannot make up the story uh, uh, behind Fred Chrisman. You cannot, you cannot make this stuff up. Fred Chrisman was a character in Oliver Stone's film, right? Uh, JFK. And if you back all of that up, Fred Chrisman was connected to Hoover. Fred Chrisman was connected to the FBI. Fred Chrisman was uh, uh, connected to uh, different. I, 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 there's not enough time for me to get into it, but re uh, religious elements, the Catholic Church, Hoover, and UFOs. And if you back up Fred Christman's history uh, from JFK and before, the original UFO sighting in the United States in Maury Island in Seattle, Washington, and the deaths of pilots and the crashing of planes and the retrieval of, of UFO debris, that was Fred Christman all the mm. way, all the way up and to uh, the JFK assassination. And right there, if, if people want to know if stuff can be connected just look up Fred Chrisman. He is one of the most uh, intriguing figures in, in the history of the United States. And, and you can't make that up, Nick. No, you could not. And I mean, quickly, um, another guy, a guy uh, when I say a guy, a man named Guy Bannister. Guy Bannister was um, an FBI agent um, in the 1940s through the 1950s. And Guy Bannister was also one of the first FBI agents to investigate 
um, flying saucer cases for J. Edgar Hoover, the director of the of the FBI. Um, and if you know your history of the JFK assassination, you'll know that Guy Bannister was also fingered as one of the assassins of JFK. And um, that's another sort of classic example. And, and, and Guy Bannister and Fred Chrisman were connected. <clears throat> that's the yes, other. Th- yep. That is... Yep. I mean, when uh, uh, you look into uh, the history of UFOs, you get into uh, uh, Werner von Braun, Operation Paperclip, right? The space program, the space race with Russia, UFO sightings, uh, the United States Air Force, the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, the, the assassination of JFK. Who are the two guys? that just keep popping up from 1947 to 1963, Guy Bannister and Fred Christman. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's insane to me. It is all connected. I want to take a quick break here. Um, I'm so happy that you brought those two up and, uh, and, and the story and the history of men in black and uh, the, the, how, how, how I want to say this right. Um, the folklore, the mythology uh, behind UFOs and what has been going on. Those two guys have been at the center of all of it all the way across the United States. Their name pops up all the time, and I just find that fascinating. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, the one and only Nick Redfern. We're talking about our strange world. Stay right there. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. Hi, everybody. This is Rob Halford, the Mental Guard, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Your one million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse, KUNX DB, BX. Right now, the world couldn't be more chaotic. History shows us what gold does when the world goes crazy. It goes up in value. Right now, we're in unprecedented times. The pandemic, the war in Ukraine, the devaluation of the U.S. dollar. Gold and other precious metals are a defense measure against the hyperinflation that's happening right now. So what can you do to protect yourself? Call my friend Alan Johnson at United Gold Group. He's dedicated to helping people secure their retirement income. He'll help you with gold, with silver, and other precious metals and show you how to set up your own self-directed IRA. Safe and secure, United Gold Group makes gold ownership easy and affordable. There couldn't be a better time, so call now and get a silver American Eagle proof set with a qualified IRA. Call 800-753-8534. That's 800-753-8534 or visit unitedgoldgroup.com. Reach out to my friend, Alan Johnson. The Believer is the chilling true story of Dr. John Mack, a renowned Harvard psychiatrist and Pulitzer Prize winner. This is an outreach program from the cosmos to the consciously impaired. He risked it all to investigate human encounters with aliens. The Believer Alien Encounters, Hard Science, and The Passion of John Mack. Written by award-winning former New York Times journalist and author Ralph Blumenthal. Now available in paperback from High Road Books. Are you ready to read about true paranormal events? Unex Media publishes nonfiction books about UFOs, ghosts and haunted places, time anomalies, cryptid creatures, and more. Just like KUNXDB Radio, it's all about unexplained phenomena. Visit www.unxmedia.com to see our list of great book titles by Debbie Ziegelmeyer, Gene Walker, Devin Listrom, Wayne Lawrence, Bill Spicer, and yours truly, Margie Kay. That's unxmedia.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I only drink Fade to Black blend coffee from River Moon. Just click on the River Moon Coffee banner at jimmychurchradio.com. Promo code F2B Blend. This is the only way forward. This is Made to Black. Make contact. 
Join us August 5th through the 7th, 2022 at the Drury Conference Center in Cape Girardeau, Missouri for the launch of the Midwest Conference on the Unknown. There are three interactive days packed with vendors, exhibitors, and nationally recognized researchers presenting on unknown topics like UFO UAP phenomena, ghosts, and Bigfoot, and Missouri's own Momo. The Missouri Monster, Cape Girardeau, has long been one of the most sought-out areas for UFO enthusiasts since the 1941 UFO crash. And now is your chance to be a part of the inaugural conference. Visit cape-events.com or follow us on Facebook at Midwest Conference on the Unknown. For more information, X listeners get 30% off by using the promo code XVIP. That's Cape Events.com, promo code XVIP. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fade to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the Fade to Black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of Fade to Black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony. Damn it. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Nick Redfern is with us. We're talking about our strange world. Strange indeed. And next up, Nick, um, I want to talk about ghosts and uh, the paranormal. And when I uh, when I say that everything is connected, I'm not sure that I understand what ghosts are today and what the paranormal really represents. I used to, growing up, I thought ghosts were dead relatives, right? <laughs> but I'm not so sure if if that is the case. When when I bring up ghosts, what what what's your definition? What do you think is going on? Well, uh, I mean, I'm not really someone who's done a lot of research into that area. Um, you know, it's, it's it's just something that's doesn't really sort of doesn't really kind of um grab me uh really i guess is the best way to say it um but um you know I, i've sort of read of things along that path but um but really ghost hunting's not really my thing um and, i don't know why uh, yeah well, mean... <laughs> that's a that's a great uh opportunity for me to say why <laughs> well um well, I, I, I'm not really sure why, but sometimes I just get bored with these shows, you know, where they're all in the buildings and, um, you know, with the infrared and whatever, and um, and there's nothing new, really. Well, know, I I, 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 I'm, I'm approaching this from another side, though, in that could the phenomena, uh, entities, spirits, ghosts, um, could we be off target and it, could this be something else? Not only interdimensional, uh, could it be time travelers? Uh, could it be uh, something else that, you know, we are looking at 
or looking for uh, the easy answers. And it may not be that. It may be something else entirely. And I, that is my point. Well, it's sort of, I, I don't, it's hard to say for me, you know, when it comes to, you know, things like ghosts and things like that, but because I haven't really done, you know, read much on it or sort of, um, you know, done research in that field. Um, but, um, you know, I've sort of spent most of my time sort of on cryptozoology, ufology, and, and some aspects of, um, conspiracies as well so. yeah and uh and and what about time travel um and and that part of things too as well um when i talk about our strange world um time travel seems to be one of the most romantic mm -hmm. things that we can talk about everybody wants to travel uh, back into the past or go into the future um, but we don't actually know or have proof of, of time travel being a reality. Is it because time travelers are somebody that we may not be able to necessarily see? Um, what, what do you make of that? Well, I mean, time travel is an interesting aspect uh, to me. I, I wrote a book actually called Time Travel, um, and um, not a, not the greatest title, but it uh, it works, you know. <laughs> um, but um, I think you know the, there's different aspects of time travel. You know, you've got the classic angle in like a, a Hollywood movie, you know, where they get in the DeLorean or whatever and go back, you know, to twenty years ahead or or behind that kind of angle however you know i would say and i talk about this in the book i i would say that um time travel you know can be demonstrated in many ways for example a lot of people over the years have had sort of prophetic dreams you know they dream of something um say tomorrow and five days later something almost identical happens now that is an example of time being altered, you know. So, you know, you don't need a time machine, you know, to demonstrate um, some degree of time travel, you know. And um, and I think that's an as a fascinating aspect, um, the idea of, um, you know, having prophetic dreams and they come true 10 days down the line that actually happened um at point pleasant west virginia in december <clears throat> 1967 um when the um when the bridge collapsed at point pleasant um in the lead up to when that happened a number of people um had these prophetic dreams um of people of this huge disaster at Point Pleasant, and of, and of course it happened, you know, where the the Mothman was seen um, at Point Pleasant. Um, I think it was forty six people were drowned, and um, so I think in some way we are able to move maneuver through time, um, but it doesn't have to be need to be you know on some sort of cool metallic device where you jump inside but somehow our minds can um actually um time travel as well so i think that's an intriguing aspect too the um the the idea of time travel uh, just going directly at this is is pretty easy we can do it today right we don't need like you said we don't need a time machine you just need a spaceship to travel away from earth and then come back and when you get back to earth you're going to be in the future depending on how long you're gone how fast you're traveling uh that dictates how much time is going to pass here on earth so if you and i did that today nick and and we took off and we came back 500 if today we did this in 2022 and we come back 500 years in the future um and we ask hey, have you guys uh figured out time travel yet and they said yes 
well, we would like to go back to 2022. Okay. If you and I then came back to 2022 from 500 years in the future, why wouldn't we have evidence of that? Or would we come back and we simply are not part of this timeline, right? We could see it, we could witness it, but we may not be able to participate. And that's the part of time travel that I, I, I swear I'm just perplexed uh, by that aspect of it, why we wouldn't see evidence of time travelers now today. Well, yeah, I mean, this kind of sort of um, goes down the path of, you know, how time may be, um, you know, if, if you try and time travel, um, maybe you'll be you'll be prevented from doing this or doing that. Right. Or maybe maybe the the nature of nature itself presents it from happening. You know, I think that's kind of a, an interesting angle. And and another aspect that's intriguing as well is that um, I've, I've spoken to a, several people who thought that um, they felt that perhaps the the men in black were time travellers and um, and sometimes they pop up when there are sort of critical events and maybe they're actually the good guys rather than bad guys and and they really they're the good guys and they're trying to put the um, the time back in its um, its linear um, approach if you like uh, like a time police if you will yes exactly but we view them as as the bad guys but uh, you know the irony is that maybe they're really the good guys but they're try they're, they might be a bit of hard-handed but they're trying to prevent from um you know certain events in time from being stopped or maybe they they have to not prevent it they have to just leave it to alone because if we change it uh, deliberately you know, it could create an even bigger disaster or whatever. Is is the Mandela effect uh, an example of of time travelers changing the past? Yes, I think yes. <laughs> I could probably answer that one in a, in a, yeah in a second. Yeah, I think there's, uh, and I think the you know the Mandela issue. You know, you've got portals, doorways, uh, black holes. Um, and prof prophetic dreams. The I think this is important because time travel isn't just one thing. You know, it can be achieved. I think in multiple ways, and um, and that in, in alone, you know, is fascinating. Wait, with uh, with the Mandela effect, I I find it uh, pretty convincing that. Millions and millions of people remember the past yeah. exactly the yeah. same, right? But but apparently they're wrong, right? <laughs> yeah, well, right, that's right. Yeah, I mean the one I like the 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 most, um, you know the the, uh, the the photograph of the Thunderbird, um, this giant Thunderbird. Um, <clears throat> that a lot, many people in the field of cryptozoology have said they've seen this photograph of a gigantic bird um, that was seen in various magazines in the 1960s. And now no one can find the magazines, no one can find the picture, but everybody in the arena, if you like, remembers it. They remember the picture. They remember reading the story. They remember the photograph in the magazine. No one can find any part of it today. It's it's kind of like in Back to the Future when, um, you know, when uh, Marty's um, brother uh, and, his, and his photograph starts to vanish from the photo. You know, I had uh, I had the same experience. I've I've talked about this before on the air. Um, and I can't explain this, Nick, but this is what happened. Fourth grade, fourth grade, I'm in Chicago, and our class is going to the Field Museum, which is the Natural History Museum in Chicago. It's big. It's nice. And uh, I got a brochure, fourth grade. 
And on the front of the brochure, and it was, it was more like a little mini magazine, but on the front of it is a giant, a, a skeleton of a giant human. And it said, uh, and I remember reading the whole thing, and uh, I, 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 it was 10 foot tall human skeleton, you know, at the Field Museum. And I was all excited uh, to go in and see this skeleton. It doesn't yeah. exist. Today, I have tried to find any reference to the Field Museum in Chicago with giant human skeletons. Zero reference. But I held it in my hand, right? I saw it. And and I was excited. And I cannot find any reference to it at all today. None. None. It doesn't exist. And And I didn't make it up. I didn't dream it. Uh, this was a real event in my life that I was excited for. And and today, Field Museum, Chicago, giant skeletons, no, never happened. Yeah, that, that, that's a perfect example. And and, uh, and if anybody wants to learn more about the, the whole Mandela phenomenon, you know, I think um, if, you, if you Google <clears throat> Thunderbird um, photograph missing, you'll you'll find a bunch of articles that talk about how so many people have seen this photograph back in the 60s and people have looked and you know look here there all over the place and yet no one despite going through all the magazines and newspapers everybody remembers but that with those images in their minds are no longer there and again the big question is how and why should those events happen to some people, but but not to others? You know, with the um, the photographs that you're talking about, and we've all seen them. You know, the the dudes are standing around holding the wings out, right? They're like in front yeah. of a barn, um, and it's a yeah. thunderbird. Almost looks like a pterodactyl, right? It's ginormous. It's big, um, and, and those photographs were distributed before, obviously, before computers and, and Photoshop. Um, the photographs themselves, have they ever been authenticated? Is there, a, you know, is there a vetting process where we can chase that back to where those photographs even originated? Forget about the magazines and the Mandela effect, and I totally get that. But, but what about prior to that? You know, were they ever in a newspaper in the 1900s? They look po the, the guys are posing with these images, or I mean, with oh, these birds. Well, basically, what it what it comes down to <clears throat> what it comes down to, Jimmy, is that what we have we have photographs based um, like like mocked up um, pictures of the original ones. You know, people have said this is what we saw. You know, back in nineteen twenty or whatever, and people have sort of restored them or something along those lines if you like but the but the original ones have never been found no but but people have people have made versions not not as hoaxes but to demonstrate you know as as to um how they look now yeah i've 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 always been fascinated with that because and it's not just um, I saw just recently in the in the last couple of days um, an article from 1901, uh, 1901, New Mexico, um, and this rancher found a giant skeleton on his property, and an un, you know recovered took a picture of it. That made it into, I believe, the New York Times is where I saw the article, and that uh, the un a couple of universities were going out to do an archaeological dig, and that, yes, indeed, there were dozens of these giant skeletons that were found on the property. The picture is clearly there. You go to find any evidence of this in the media after that, it doesn't exist. But the article did pop up in the New York Times. After that, squashed. Is that the Mandela effect or is that the Smithsonian, right, <laughs> stepping in and, and burying this story? Yeah, and don't forget as well, um, in the Rendlesham case, 
you know that when Jim Penniston said that um, he felt that um, that the the so-called aliens that landed in Rendlesham Forest, that um, he said that he felt that they were actually time travelers. It is, wasn't that the download? The download told him that they weren't yeah, that's ETs. Right. Yes, right. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And, yeah. They, yeah. They. In 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 your book, you wrote that that might have been a psychological experiment. Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, unfortunately, you know, Rendlesham, you know, has as many theories as as Roswell does, you know, and I'm not sure, um, you know, we'll ever get the answers. And I also think that some of the theories that have been inserted by government agencies to basically sort of um you know mess everything up so nobody really knows what the the true answer is you know but um so that's why you know there've been so many books about Rendlesham and, and many of them um a lot different to each other and I, and I think somewhere in the you know is is the real story um but with multiple um, stories seeded into the UFO community, if you like. Uh, we have to be careful as to, you know, which is the real one and which is the one to um, push us, you know, the wrong way or whatever. What I what I find interesting uh, today, Nick, and I'm sure you've thought about this yourself, is with the focus, like with the UFO hearings that we had back in May, um, UFO hearing, I should say, um, with the focus being on military cases, right? 2004 Nimitz, the 144 sightings, the other 40 uh, uh, Air Force pilots, Navy pilots, and uh, what the military is experiencing with UFOs and UAPs. Why isn't there any discussion about Rendlesham? Where we've got a complete military history documented, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I I don't understand that part. Why they don't want to go and discuss Rendlesham, but they'll talk about these modern military sightings. But the biggest military case besides Roswell is Rendlesham, and it's right there. Why why are they scared about uh, 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 talking about Rendlesham and that evidence? Well, I mean, I mean, I'm speculating, but my specu <laughs> speculations would be, in case maybe that there's some data that's still being withheld, you know, from things like Rendlesham, mm -hmm. and that, um, and maybe there's something that the thing that is being withheld, maybe that's something that certain people don't want, but they might that. They might not worry too much about lights in the sky, but they might be very concerned about something that um, takes the story to a, a different level. So I think, you know, we, we can never sort of really be sure as to where the story ends, you know, or if, uh, or if the story is a story, you know, created to protect the real story. Now, uh, before I let you go, I wanted to mention, um, I'll let you take it as far as you want to take it, but you've got a new book coming out uh, September 1st. You're going to be back on Fade to Black and we'll uh, announce uh, the, the release and it, it's going to be exciting and we'll do all of that. Um, but you don't necessarily uh, uh, deal with UFOs all the time and, and, and Mothman, right? <laughs> Bigfoot and Crypto, Men in Black. Uh, this is a different. This is a different type of book for you. Can you tell us about it? Well, yeah. Um, the the book basically, you know, if you look all around the world, various places, you know, we've got these gigantic structures. You know, whether it's Easter Island, Egypt, um, Baalbek in the Middle East. You know, these these terrifically gigantic stones. Um, you know, sort of a thousand tons, and I'm not exaggerating some of them, you know, and the big question is, how could these stones have been moved um, at such um, distances and to such heights and, and when they weigh at so, you know, incredible um, weights, 
how back thousands of years ago, how were we able to, if it was us, <laughs> um, how was it done? You know, how was that process achieved? And so the book is a study of the possibility of uh, the likes of anti-gravity in the distant past, um, finding ways to um, effectively um, find ways back in, in ancient times, possibly people back then or extraterrestrials. I'm, I'm sort of ambiguous um, on e either side because I'm not 100% sure, you know. But I think um, in the distant past, somebody or something had the ability to move gigantic stones around the world and we have either lost the uh, the way this was done or it has been deliberately hidden. Um, but whatever the answer is, um, that's the theme of the of the book, um, looking at the issue of anti-gravity and gigantic ancient stones. I can't wait for the release, my man. I, I, I can't. Oh, oh, I can't. I mean, I, I get them all in advance, and this is the one where I'm checking my mailbox every day. Right. Oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Nick, you're the very best, man. Thank you so much. Another great conversation. And and I, I will have you back September 1st uh, to celebrate uh, the release of, of this book. I'm looking forward to it. And uh, thank you for everything. You're the best. Thank you, Nick. All right. Thanks a lot, Jimmy. See you're, you later. You're the best. Nick Redfern. And like I said, we will have... Nick on the show uh, September 1st uh, to announce uh, the release and the publish uh, the publishing of his new book about anti-gravity and megalithic structures. This is Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. What a great show tonight. I'm going to open up the phone lines. Uh, so when we come back and let me see here, let me get this going. There it is. This is Fade to Black. I'll be right back after this short break. Stay with us. You're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the X. Hey, what up, y'all? It's your girl Vivica Fox here, and you are listening to my boy, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. Hello, Fader Knots. Jimmy Church here. You've seen me with my thunderstorm. Now you can purify the air in your home and get healthy, clean, fresh smelling air and eliminate odors just like I do right here in the bunker. The Eden Pier Thunderstorm uses oxy technology that naturally sends out O3 molecules into the air, which seek out odors and air pollutants in your home and destroys them. It's called a thunderstorm because it purifies the air just like after a thunderstorm. And right now, you can save $200 on an Eden Pier Thunderstorm 3 pack for whole home protection. With this special offer, you're getting three units for under $200. Seriously. Go to EdenPureDeals.com and use Fader 3. Shipping is free and it's easy. Just scroll down. You'll see my name right there, Jimmy Church. Click on it and get your deal today. That's EdenPureDeals.com. This is Billy Carson, founder and CEO of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv is the fastest growing and one of the most watched networks in the world. And I would like to personally invite you to check out our expanding library of TV, film, lectures, and special presentations. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv has over 6,000 videos covering lost history, health, UFOs, spirituality, and our future. We are committed to our community. And with my personal invitation, you can right now get your own free 30-day membership at Forbidden knowledge.tv your own library of information starts today at forbidden knowledge.tv your one million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse kunx db bx 
Are you ready to read about true paranormal events? Unex Media publishes nonfiction books about UFOs, ghosts and haunted places, time anomalies, cryptid creatures, and more. Just like KUNXDB Radio, it's all about unexplained phenomena. Visit www.unxmedia.com to see our list of great book titles by Debbie Ziegelmeyer, Gene Walker, Devin Listrom, Wayne Lawrence, Bill Spicer, and yours truly, Margie Kay. That's unxmedia.com. Introducing the Game Changer Blend from River Moon Coffee that delivers a customized blend made specifically for the Fader Knots. If the game is rigged, change the game. It's a bolder cup with some bite. Game Changer is the coffee of choice for those that prefer an organic dark roast that is slightly lighter and milder, but it's still dark. With wild notes of pecans and chocolate with a rich, balanced, full-bodied cup that is roasted to perfection for a great coffee to start your day as an after-dinner coffee or anywhere in between. Artisan, small batch, roasted to perfection. USDA certified organic, all River Moon coffee is freshly roasted and packaged in the USA. Just go to rivermooncoffee.com or click on the banners over on our site and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. rivermooncoffee.com Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? you love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in paranormal talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. I want to thank Nick Redfern for uh, another great show and an excellent conversation. And uh, we'll have Nick back uh, September 1st uh, when the book uh, goes into worldwide release and uh, we will talk about it. And there you go. Now, I've opened up the phone lines, uh, 818-921-6929 or uh, 323-275-9695. Got a bunch of calls on hold and also calls coming in. So let me grab this and uh, let me uh, put, I'm putting you on hold. You just stay right there. You don't go anywhere. And let's see, who did I have on hold? We'll bring this call. You were in first. Okay. And I just posted this up. Jimmy, did you see the American Horror Story season last year where they did the uh, Ike Eisenhower Edwards Treaty narrative? That was excellent. I, um, Ryan Murphy and, uh, the entire, uh, American horror story, uh, series, I am absolutely fascinated with and, and I watch it constantly <laughs> and there is, um, that's not the only, um, uh, that's not the only, um, uh, American horror story that uh, uh, dealt with uh, UFOs. I think it was season two, uh, The Asylum. That season starts off with, um, uh, hang on for a second. Okay, what is going on? Who is on hold? Okay, that call. Okay, don't don't hang up. If you're on hold, uh, uh, don't hang up. Don't hang up. Don't hang up. Don't do it. Don't do it. uh, season two, the asylum that if you haven't seen it, okay, I don't want to give too much away, but the, the opening, uh, I think it's episode one, we're talking alien abduction. Now that season, man, you need to go and watch that because it, I don't want to give anything away, but, uh, that, that is, uh, an alien abduction, uh, hybrid 
uh, program uh, with E.T. that is going on. Watch season two of, of American Horror Story. Season 10, the second half, I think it was the last five episodes. I can't remember. Um, I've, I've seen it a couple of times, though. The last four or five episodes deals with Eisenhower and Edwards Air Force Base. And it's it's really well done, too, as well. Um, I love American Horror Story. I can't. I can. I, I could literally... Uh, speak about American Horror Story every night on the air uh, for the rest of the year. Um, uh, I'm I'm that impressed with it. All right, all right. Let's go to the phones. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Who's calling? Hello. Yes, you're live. How you doing, Jimmy? The Dirt Road Demon from Casco, Michigan. Love the show, Jimmy. And I love all your guitars back there. Oh, thank you, man. Thank you, man. You, uh, do you play? Yeah, here and there. Mainly bass, though. Okay. All right. What kind of bass do you have, real quick? I I got an old school dinky. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Short scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. Good for you, man. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Jimmy. Uh, what was your name? Derek. Derek. What's on your mind tonight? Not much. Just calling and uh, saying it's a great show. I like it when you got uh, the old school uh, experts on, you know, that I'm used to hearing. I know a lot of people are used to hearing over the years. Like that used to be on the old coast to coast days. So it's nice to to have the, the real experts on there, at least in my book. Yeah, I agree with you, Derek. And and Nick Redfern, and thank you for the phone call. I, and Nick Redfern is somebody that uh, I have followed for years, and uh, I've got most of his books. I probably have 20 or 30 of them. Um, and I, he's just somebody that I respect, and he does a lot of research and, and gets into these subjects. Plus, He's 100% rock and roll. So there you go. Derek, That's it. enjoy enjoy the rest of your night, my man. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jimmy. It's a great phone call right there. Thank you, Derek. And uh, he's right, though. Um, sometimes uh, I, I go both ways uh, with all of this in that I love having first-time guests on the show. Uh, That's great. And that was one of the things I enjoyed about Coast to Coast, and which I tried to do over at Coast uh, when I was there, was having first-time guests on. Because uh, I would do that. I would dial in uh, to Coast, uh, especially when it was a guest I had never heard of. But then again, I, I want to hear from Stanton Friedman. I want to hear from uh, Linda Moulton Howe. I would I enjoy uh, the guest, uh, you know, Stanton Friedman, that – that uh, uh, we listen to over and over again for their research. Um, so there is that part of it. And I do the same thing here on, on Fade to Black. But uh, so having Nick Redford on for me is a treat. Like last week, Whitley and Linda and, and, and Dolan all on the same week. That was, that was a great week for me to, to be able to just sit down with uh, uh, these uh, researchers that we have looked up to over the years and, 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 and continue to have excellent shows. And, and last week, three nights of, of the best of the best, but totally new information and new conversations. Uh, I totally dig that. Let's go back to the phones. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Who's calling? You're live. Hi, this is Yes, you're uh, like, totally turn me that. down, <laughs> turn me down in the background. Turn me down right now. All right, gotcha. Okay, you're live. Who's calling? This is Steve from Illinois. Hi, Steve. How are you tonight, man? What's on your mind? Well, there, there's a lot of things on my mind, but uh, one of the things I really wanted to ask you, Jimmy, is the origination of, you know, when you sign off, and stuff. I just have a really quick question: Is why do you say Gobekli Tepe? Gobekli Tepe is the oldest megalithic site on planet Earth. It's twelve thousand years old, and it is in southern Turkey on the Syrian border. And it wasn't supposed to exist. It is seven thousand years older than Giza, than the Great Pyramids. 
And there wasn't supposed to be an older megalithic site like that anywhere in the world, let alone something 7,000 years older than Giza. We don't know who built it. We don't know what it means. And it is stunningly beautiful. So you can look up Go Beckley Tepe and go look at the site. And it's incredible. And we're finding more about Gobekli Tepe uh, every day. It is, uh, it's an anomaly uh, in history. It wasn't supposed to exist, and we don't know who built it. Wow, that, 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 that's exactly what I was thinking, because I, I have done a little research on it, but I don't know exactly, you know, what the, you know, it, it's all about, but I appreciate that, Jimmy. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Steve, and I appreciate that, and, and, uh, go and do your research, and, and thank you for the phone call. And the Gobekli Tepe, I mean, to me, um, when we think about uh, this planet and the history of things, Gobekli Tepe, uh, you know, at 10,000 B.C., if we listen to historians um, that want to archaeologists and anthropologists, and they want to tell us about what you know the facts of us when clearly they have been wrong, wrong. That somebody with that kind of artistic sense, number one, to do relief carvings on on the pillars. That's that's the first thing. The second thing is the engineering and the ability to quarry stones and transport them 12,000 years ago like that? Well, that wasn't uh, Stone Age man wandering around in, in animal skins. We already had that problem with Giza at 3,000 B.C. The Stone Age, uh, there were no uh, <laughs> tools you know, and 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 we had a hard time uh, digesting that and understanding that. And then you back up another seven thousand years or more before Giza, and then there's there's Gobekli Tepe, um, absolutely stunningly beautiful. And we don't know its purpose, and we don't know who built it. Um, it's absolutely incredible. So yes, Gobekli Tepe, and that is the meaning behind it. Uh, I, I'll never, I'll never stop with go back Lee Tepe. Let's, uh, go back to the phones. Hi, you're live on faded black. Who's calling? Hi, Jimmy. Yes. Oh, you can hear me. I wasn't sure if I was just listening. It's Jessica Rodriguez from Mass. Hi, Jessica. How are you tonight? <laughs> so speaking of go, go back Lee Tepe, have you ever heard of care, uh, Karahan Tepe? Uh, are, yes, of course. Okay. I just, you always say Gobekli Tempe, and I always put at the end Gobekli Tempe and Karahan Tempe, or Tepe, I'm sorry. Right, I right. I my words mixed up. Yeah, that's, and, a, um, go ahead, you called me. Well, no, I just, I wanted to know what, like, what you know about it. Well, uh, you know everything about everything. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, smoke and mirrors, Jessica, smoke and mirrors. But here's the thing. Um, uh, uh, Gobekli Tepe was originally discovered uh, by the farmer uh, there in, in 1994. 1995, mm. um, when the archaeologist arrived there, that, okay, so that was 27 years ago. And as Gobekli Tepe was revealed to the world and they did the carbon testing and carbon dating and, and then we've, we find out that it's you know 12,000 years old, 10,000 BC, at the end of the last ice age, that right there tipped over everything that we knew about human history. But I had mm -hmm. said, and many others, if Gobekli Tepe exists, how many other Gobekli Tepes are on planet Earth that have yet to be discovered. And, right, and, and buried in the sands oh, that it, we haven't even discovered. It, it could be anywhere. It could be in North America, uh, Central America, South America. It could be in Asia. It could be in, uh, in Northern Asia. It could be in China. It could be in, uh, in, in Northern Europe, uh, Eastern Europe, Southern Europe. It could be in, in Italy. We, it, it could be anywhere. 
But um, right. uh, they have now found 12 more, 11, Gobekli Tepe being one, 12 more around Gobekli Tepe. Um, and uh, I think that it is, uh, it's going to continue this way. It's just there. Is, there is. Is that is that what they're calling um, Karahan? Is that he said? Yeah, Karahan Tepe. Yeah, Karahan Tepe. Kara Kara. But there. Yeah, is that what they're calling that? Because I'm looking at pictures of it right now. Like it's like flashing by different pictures. And right. They had the all the holes in the ground. I think it was to like collect the water. And then there's like a statue. It looks kind of like a bear, lion alien reptile type thing i don't know what it is then there's like it looks like aliens like on the walls like carved in it it's like weird well Very odd looking. yes and but it goes <laughs> it goes beyond that jessica there mm -hmm. if, if look up right now look up urfa man u-r-f-a urfa man and, yeah, I've looked that up before. Okay, Urfa Man is an example of something that simply should not exist if we listen to right. the academics. That's that statue with the with the fingers. Yep. With the belt. Yep. 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 I know exactly what you're talking yep. about. Yep. Wearing some pretty fancy clothing. I and I it might looks have. It, it looks like uh, some. Uh, interesting things below the belt going on down yeah, there, there but i'm not sure if that's what that actually is there's two <laughs> there is two of them yes 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 so you, you are they, want, they say there they say there's one with a loincloth which i'm like mm, i don't know if that looks like a loincloth or if that's <laughs> him holding his you know, and yeah. and holding and hanging down, you know. Yes, yes. The male part. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, his pee, -pee. I'm like, yeah, I don't know. Yes. Uh, so, but but those are, that that's those are simple examples of things that really, honestly, shouldn't exist. And Urfa Man, right. Urfa Man is beautiful. I mean, that is one of the right. most amazing sculptures ever in the history of man, and it's ten thousand years old. 10,000 years know old. Of. That we know of. That's crazy town. So we are going to continue uh, to find things. Now, um, you brought up uh, Karen Tepe, but th there's another strange anomaly over in Armenia called Kara Hunj, uh, which is Stonehenge in Armenian. And that's another megalithic site that uh, has been ignored. And it's it's just I as think a, I've seen stuff on that too. Yeah, or read stuff it, about it. And yeah, watch because I watch documentaries all the time. So yeah, so uh, I know we cannot deny that there were advanced civilizations before Mesopotamia and before Giza. That's it. There's way right. too much evidence, and we are. Um, and then uh, all the Anunnaki tablets, like they're telling the story right there of human history and what happened, when it happened, how long they lived, the king's list. Like you can't say that all that stuff is, you know, not true. It's like they ca carved it out of stone. They did things that hu are inhumanly possible to us today. And look at all the structures in India. I mean, they're like it looks like a laser beam came down into the mountain. You know, all those church, uh, I forgot what those churches are called. Oh my God, they start with a B. But there's like 12 of them and they're literally squares in the ground and the churches were just, you know, I don't know if you know which site I'm talking about in India, but the they're like um, cross shaped, I guess. And it's like a square and it's built from a big, huge, mountainside uh, you know a big rock and they went from the inside from the top down mm -hmm. that's how they built the religious temples yes and they still go in them today and some of them are oh my god the artwork and the detail in the stone there's no way they did that with chisels and copper things and stuff like that so yeah, we I'm just, just have to yeah, about that. yeah, Jessica. We just have to accept that uh, this version of us wasn't the first. That's it. Right. And we have to accept that. And and what is wrong with that? 
And if, there isn't anything wrong with it. It's the government hiding it from us. But why? Well, why? Here, why can they know and we can't? Well, what's here, the big secret? <laughs> you should start your own radio show, Jessica. You would you would do just fine. But uh, and, and thank, thank you for thank you, you think? For, uh, thank you for the phone call, Jessica. Be safe and be well. And I'll see you tomorrow night. All right, you too. All right. Talk to you soon. Fade to black. Go back, Lee Tepe. That's Jessica Rodriguez. Thank you, Jessica. And um, and here's 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 the best point with with all of that. And and please listen to my words carefully. Earth is five billion years old, four and a half billion years old. Okay, and let's say stable version of Earth. With a with a breathable thing, and you know uh, the molten lava has ended. That's three billion years old. Us, the version of us, has allegedly uh, been here for one hundred and fifty thousand years, two hundred thousand years at the extreme. The smart version of us, allegedly has been around for about 10,000 years since the last ice age. And then we've only had science, this version of us, for 300 years. All right? Now, if we back up, that I'm talking about 3 billion years. So 3 billion years, the version of us is like a thin layer of paint on the edge of this wall, right? And if you take out a slice as thick as this guitar pick, three billion years, and you take out a slice of human history, that would be 100,000 years, 200,000 years, that little slice. And if, if a civilization came and went in anywhere in that three billion years, that little slice, nature would have taken it over, buried it, nature, nature we wouldn't know that it was ever here if we ended tomorrow right if whatever happened if asteroid some crazy thing you know whatever if we ended today in a hundred thousand years what evidence would there be of us what evidence we'd have to go and search for it but if you flew over and took a look, would you see New York City? Probably not, right? And and that's that's the truth. So looking back in deep history and finding evidence of a previous civilization, certainly like Gobekli Tepe, and that's recent, what's wrong with having that discussion? The answer is nothing, nothing. And we we have no you cannot stop life on this planet. You can't stop life. It starts and restarts, ends, starts, restarts, ends constantly all the time. And and that's it. So what if that did happen? What's wrong with that discussion? Let's go back to the phones. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Who's calling? Charles. Charles. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from uh, Madeira, right out of Fresno, California, All right off out of Earth. Yep. All right. What's on your mind, man? Oh, uh, well, I want to tell you about an encounter of some extraterrestrials I had. Can you, I can, can you do it in three minutes? <laughs> I'll try to. I'll okay. just let you know this. Something went wrong. See, I had a water bed, and it tripped them out. They came in my room, and the door cracked open. And a blue light came in, and right when it hit my wall, it expanded across my whole room, and it pushed me down into the waterbed, right? And, and it didn't immobilize me. I was in the waterbed. I'm, like, freaking out. They come in, and by the way, these ones had, like, like a pinkish, orangish skin. And they were looking at me, and one of them made a mad face because it's like, hey, something's going wrong here. He's not immobilized. And um, I remember every single bit of it. How, I, it how old were you? Dream. How old were you? I was 15 years old, and I still remember it to this day. And um, you know, uh, it was it was it was very it was really trippy. And then so I was actually able to to squeeze. 
it felt like like the ceiling came down on me and pushed me into my waterbed. But I was actually able to squeeze out from the side of it, and I hit the ground. And then when I hit the ground, it immobilized me, and I went into paralysis. And, it, you know, um, I wish I had more time to talk to you about it. But, um, you know, I mean, it, it was, it was I, to this day, you know, I'm just so, you know, infatuated with everything with the paranormal and stuff because I know it's real. Yeah, right on, so. Charles. Yeah, right on, right on. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. That water interfered with their ability to, right, and and yeah. and, and freeze frame you. But as soon as you got uh, off of the waterbed, then their whatever they were using to immobilize you uh went into full effect yes sir and i and they didn't write my memory i remember that part of it which is very strange the rest of it i don't know i need to get uh hypnotized or something <laughs> right right on charles well it's too bad we're at the end of the show but on thursday night uh which is fader night call me back and we'll talk more about it oh it'll be great i got more all right, thank you, sir. <laughs> All right, Charles. Have a great night. And uh, what a great way to end this show. Uh, fantastic calls. And uh, I want to thank Nick Redfern uh, for coming in. Uh, great, great conversation with him tonight. And also, I want to remind everybody, he's going to be back at uh, uh, the end of the month. Well, at the end of August. We're not quite in August yet. Today is the 26th. But he'll be back on September 1st, and we're going to do a big announcement uh, for the release of his new book. What a great show tonight. I want to thank everybody. Tomorrow night, Nick Pope is here. We're going to be talking about government programs around the world, government UFO programs, that and so much more tomorrow night with Nick Pope. And uh, before I get out of here, I want to, uh, seriously, American Horror Story, um, it is, now look, it is not, for everybody, American Horror Story is freedom of thought when it comes to writing. And Ryan Murphy uh, doesn't care about being uh, politically correct or staying in the safe zone. Oh, no. And uh, season one is incredible. Season two, um, I, I, I went back to that. It's called The Asylum. Because it is about E.T. and contact, and then what happens from there. Um, it, is, uh, it is about as scary uh, of a nightmare that you can go through, and that's why it's called American Horror Story. Um, all of the seasons are fantastic and are great, and uh, season 10 uh, deals uh, very directly with Eisenhower and Edwards Air Force Base, and <laughs> I don't want to give any of it away, and uh, ET contact here on Earth and the treaty. So, yes, American Horror Story, go and watch it. I don't want to let it go. Start with season one and cruise through that thing. It's absolutely incredible. This is Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Again, I want to thank Nick Redfern for another great show and conversation tonight. Tomorrow night, Nick Pope is here. And then Thursday night, of course, is another Fader night with open lines all night long. Fade to Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee, Dennis, and Kevin. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Bateau, and Mark D. Kovar. Webmaster is Drew the Geek, Music, Doug Aldrich, Intro, Space Boy. Spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and this broadcast is owned and copyrighted. 2022 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black of the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Until tomorrow night with Nick Pope, I want everybody to be safe. Go Beckley Tappy.